Mic check one two.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for um, coming tonight. My name is Kim DeSerpa. I'm your board president. Um, this meeting um, is open for April 27, 2022. We're glad you're here. If you'd like to speak to any of the agenda items tonight, we invite you. There are speaker cards. They are yellow. They're in the back of the room. You fill out the agenda item you'd like to speak to before that agenda item comes up. And you give your card to Eva, who's wave Eva, done at the end. We also have an interpreter tonight who's sitting over here. If you need interpretation services, she'll be happy to give you a headset and interpret tonight's um, proceeding. We're going to start out tonight with the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'm going to ask Trustee Acosta to lead us in the pledge. Of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And then next on the agenda is the superintendent's comments, and we have Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yeah, thank you so much. So on Monday night, we had a fantastic LCAP input session. We had almost 60 Spanish-speaking parents um, there participate with me. Um, I just want to make sure that people know we're starting. Um, Ms. Aguirre um, is going to be starting with our student um, voices next. So she has those slated to where we'll be having conversations with elementary, middle, and high school students. Um, anyone who didn't get a chance to go to a meeting um, who is a community member, I encourage you to provide your input through Thought Exchange, which will be open until May 20th. Um, so encourage that. Also excited that we're continuing our restorative start um, work. We're now calling it restorative spring. Um, and it's been so popular, we're on set five of those lessons. Um, we do have another parent meeting because we're making sure that we're including the parents on that on Monday, May 9th. Um, and so I encourage parents to attend that. We have had hundreds and hundreds of parents in the past attend them, and so I look forward to that. And then I just want to let everybody know that I will be representing the district um, in a national um, superintendent's think tank called Leading Now um, in Atlanta. So they're, they're paying my way to go there in, for the next two days. And so I'm really um, excited to not only bring our work forward on how we're ensuring equity, um, but also learn from additional superintendents from throughout the nation. So thanks so much. Thank you. The next up, we have governing board comments, and we'll start with Jennifer Holm. Thank you, President DeSerpa. Um, real quick, we had a great presentation about autism awareness during the most recent um, special education uh, community advisory committee meeting. And the recording is available for anyone who maybe wasn't able to attend. We highly recommend it. I also want to congratulate all of our PVUSD teams that competed in last week's ROV competition. Um, our, all our teams got a robot in the water that, you know, functioned in that environment. So bravo. Um, and one of our Aptos Junior High teams won an award for their presentation. So I know that all of our students who were at that competition, you know, worked really hard to get there. And, you know, I, I, congratulations to each of them. Congratulations to you know all of the teachers and staff that supported them as well. It was a tremendous effort and fun to see. So that's what I have for this evening. Thank you, Trustee Soto. Test, test. Light's not on. Wasn't sure if it worked. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I just want to take a moment and acknowledge last week's uh, recipients or uh, students who are recognized for their achievements. Uh, I just want to wish you all the best and good luck next year and um, keep, up, keep up the good work and stay with your education. It's important. Uh, thank you. Trustee Orozco. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, so it's been a couple of busy uh, past weeks for me. We did have our green committee. Um, 
And so we had a great presentation on the ocean guardian application, the requirements that go into applying for that. And it's, it was great to see several of our schools interested in moving forward with that process. So that's exciting to see. I also attended our DLAC meeting. Parents were providing information on our CT pathways um, along with summer school information. A quick reminder that the Pajaro Valley Education Gala is May 13 at 6 p.m. We're happy to announce that this year, uh, Coach Watsonville High School soccer coach uh, Roland Hedgepeth was selected as the community champion. Uh, so please come out and support. It should be a fun evening uh, with dinner, wine, um, student performances, Highland Auction, and a lot more. So um, please join us if you can. I also got the opportunity to attend our Students of the Year um, event. It's always I think one of our favorite meetings, I think, as board members, where we just get to celebrate um, youth talent within PVUSD. So congratulations to students and their families. I also participated on the Ivy League interviews. And so it was exciting just to learn about uh, the, uh, the, st the students who will be uh, visiting those campuses and learning about their stories, their backgrounds, their interests. So it was si exciting to sit uh, through those interviews with them. And lastly, um, NERVILLE 2.0, <laughs> that's this Sunday, so families, students, everyone is welcomed. Uh, PBUS students do get in for free. Uh, we have lots of different activities from um, art-led workshops to cosplay contests and several other things, so come out and support. We do want to thank PBUSD for co-sponsoring the event. Watsonville High School staff have been super accommodating, moving things around uh, to make this event a successful one. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you, uh, Tristy Shocker. Thank you, President DeSerpa. So April's been a busy month. Um, so we had our green team committee meeting, as Trustee Orozco said. Um, we also had our DALAC um, committee meeting um, discussion with parents about the upcoming summer school program. Um, we also had migrant, I had a migrant head start committee meeting, as well as Pajaro Valley Education Foundation meeting, um, discussing some exciting things um, for supporting our students. Um, we had our student recognition ceremony. The banners will be going up soon in Watsonville Plaza, honoring some of our students. Um, congratulations to all of our students who are graduating high school this year, as well as those being promoted from fifth to sixth grade, eighth grade to ninth grade. Um, great job, all of you. Um, Watsonville City Council, Dr. Rodriguez, Kim DeSerpa and I attended a prior Watsonville City Council meeting. They had to do a follow-up last night, but um, they will be giving us a grant to the Emerald Lagasse Kitchen of $100,000. So that's really good news. Um, I also attended a Starlight meeting about the Emerald Lagasse Kitchen Garden Project. It was to um, receive input from community members and staff members, as well as parents and students of the school. And that was a lot of fun collaborating with everybody. Um, last but not least, Thank you to our student athletes. They've been just on fire at all of our schools, working hard, and I've been seeing lots of names in the paper of all the great things they're doing. So keep up the good work. Thank you. Christy Acosta. Um, just briefly, I just wanted to again um, commend um, our last week's meeting recipients for all the student awards and recognitions and for all their great work that they are all doing. And again, congratulate all of our graduating seniors and our promoting students and wish all of our graduating seniors the very best in this next journey of their life. Thank you. Thank you. And um, finally, Trustee Dodge Jr. Good evening, everybody. It's good to be back here. Good to see everybody. Uh, just briefly, on May 11th, the Watsonville High School French Club is having a fundraiser at the Padres Hall in Corlitos. Uh, congratulations to all the students who got accepted to their colleges. You know, congrats and uh, just keep it going. Um, I was also able to attend, you know, the Watsonville High School baseball team, softball team. You know. A, our athletes are always doing good, you know, so I encourage people to go out and support 
um, all their teams, local teams on once Um I see a lot of construction at Mini White and E Hall, and so I just like to thank you know, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez and staff for keeping those schools upgraded. And, and finally, uh, congratulations to Superintendent Dr. Rodriguez on being recognized as the Superintendent of the Year. So I just wanted to say that and thank you for everything that you've done for Watsonville Schools. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Trustee Dodge Jr. for highlighting um, the fact that our own Superintendent Michelle Rodriguez was nominated for Superintendent of the Year for Region 10. Region 10 contains 42 school districts and out of that 42 she was chosen as the top superintendent. We're very, very fortunate and very proud of the accomplishments that you've brought um, on behalf of our students here in the Pajaro Valley and um, we thank you and we're so fortunate really to have you. I'm gonna just do a, a few highlights. Um, as reported in the newspaper by Todd Guild, um, since Dr. Rodriguez has come here, our achievement um, has gone up from 30% to 69.23%. That's a, unbelievable. We tried for years and years and years and threw a lot of money um, at trying to raise our test scores, and we never could until Michelle got here. Dr. Rodriguez, thank you for the hard work, and thank you to the staff and the teachers who embraced SIPS, essentially, which is a reading, a special reading program, which feel free to correct me if I get anything wrong here. Um, so we feel very proud of that accomplishment. Um, since you've been here, you've had a focus on the arts, including music programs, and rebuilt those. Um, behavioral health, you've implemented wellness centers, you've brought the Latino Film Institute, the Emeril Lagasse Kitchen and Culinary Garden. What am I missing? That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot. I mean, I think one of the first things you did when you walked in was you um, you took our advice, you took our pleas, and you hired a grant writer, and that grant writer has brought in how much? $14 million. $14 million um, in the last five years alone. Yeah. So thank you very much for hiring Andrea Willey. We're very fortunate to have her. Some of the other accomplishments um, that Dr. Rodriguez has um, has been bestowed with just here in our own community is in 2020 she was the community health trust um, he, what was it a hero no Phil, Phil Rather award. it was the Phil Rather award which is essentially the highest award for um, community service um, from the Pajaro Valley Health Trust in 2019 she received the United Way community hero award in 2019 she um, was invited to be in the League of Innovative Schools Anything else I should say about that? That's an important. Yeah, I think the, the reason why that one's so important to me is because it allows us to be on pace with innovation with the rest of the cutting edge districts throughout the nation. And every time that we can keep ourselves on par with the nation versus the state, I think um, we're doing good. Okay, and then finally, um, she received a competitive offer to be a fellow in the Broad, Inst the Broad is it Institute or Fellowship? The Broad Institute, which is a, it's a competitive fellowship for, and you have to be invited, and it's through Yale University. She completed an 18-month uh, training program with them in leadership, and we're very, very proud of your accomplishments. Thank you for helping us help our kids here in the Pajaro Valley. We're very excited and proud of your accomplishments. We'll be celebrating Michelle at um, a dinner on May 6th in Monterey. So thanks, everybody. I'd also quickly just like to do a little recognition for some um, acknowledge the following donations, again, to the Emerald Lagasse Culinary Garden and Teaching Kitchen Project. Um, Wendy Mullen uh, donated $200. Melanie Kett Wartenen uh, donated $2,500. The Barina Family Fund, $2,500. Allie and Nick Sutton, $1,000. Kira Halpern and Superior Foods donated $5,000. And a very special thank you again um, to our friends 
at the Watsonville City Council for making sure a donation of $100,000 was received on behalf of the culinary kitchen and garden. Is there, um, do we know about how much is left to raise of the million dollars? We have 160,000 that we still need to raise. 150? 160. 160,000. So for anyone out there who would like to donate, um, we'd appreciate it. <laughs> Okay, so now we'll move on to item 3.5, our high school student board report. Um, I think Aptos High School has provided a video. I don't know if we could cue that up. Hi. We have the proud principal Hi. here tonight, Hi. Peggy Pugh. I'm Mia Archuleta, your ASB treasurer. I'm Alex Inspector, your ASB secretary. And sadly, Jackson is not here today, but he covers our athletics. <laughs> So first, in activities, we are having our last club carnival, which will be taking place on April 29th. And we just had prom at the Coconut Grove this last Friday, and it was a huge success. And we are currently fundraising for the staff luncheon. If you eat at Aptos Street Barbecue and, and mention Aptos High, our ASB gets 20% of sales. Our sixth period class, our ninth and tenth graders, are fundraising and hosting the staff luncheon on May 25th, and this is the first time that we've ever had our sixth period class um, host a staff luncheon, so it's pretty exciting. Also, some of our sixth period students just did a transgender and non-binary informational presentation at the staff meeting. And last but not least, ASB is hosting a 10 Things I Hate About You movie night in the cafeteria on Friday, May 15th. And as for arts, Aptos High's Visual and Performing Arts is participating in the County Office of Education's Visual Art Exhibit on Friday, May 6th at the Government Office. <laughs> um, also, for over 400 frames have been put up in the Watsonville Mayor's Office, the Library, and other adjacent offices. Those will be on, on exhibit um, on Friday on May 11th. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, and then we have our choir has just finished up their pop music concert and is now getting ready for their Magical Music of Disney concerts coming up on May 14th and May 15th. Susical, the musical, is performing this week is the debut on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and next week on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday as well in our quad with an outside audience and outside sets. All right, as far as academics, Aptos High continues to kind of grow and strengthen um, our current career technical education offerings, which is known as the CTE. Um, along with this, we're going to have some new pathways coming up. So we have Visual and Commercial Arts 1, Graphic Arts and Visual and Commercial Arts, and um, Photography. Uh, next year, there will be a new Applied Chemistry and Biotechnology class. Uh, biotechnology is an applied chemistry that is a sophomore level class, and students who pass this class get the same credit as regular chemistry. Uh, students have completed their course requests for the 2022 to 2023 academic school year. Uh, freshmen also who did not take ethnic literature or ethnic studies this year are going to be prepared to take either Art 1 Ethnic Studies or World History Ethnic Studies. And Art 1 Ethnic Studies is going to be a new class offering uh, starting next year. Uh, many students you will see are working hard in their classes as we are so close to the end of the year and as always the access program is still continuing to provide the tutoring services during 6th and 7th period and after school. Okay, so I will be covering athletics today as well. So um, just to start off, baseball is coming off with a big win against Santa Cruz and it is the sole possession of first place in the SCCAL. And softball is in a tight race for league title with seven games left in their regular season. And boys golf continues to dominate play led by a strong senior class. Girls track places first in the SoCal Invitational and boys team plays third out of 19 games. Boys tennis remains unbeaten in the league and has a big match against SoCal on Tuesday here at Aptos. And boys volleyball has had several strong showings during the Carmel and SoCal tournament the last two weekends. They've they look to ride that momentum into the SCCAL tournament, and swimming wraps up the regular season this week with a duel against SLV this Thursday at SLV. After that, all the focus will be on the league tur tournament happening at Harbor High School the last weekend in April. And then lacrosse enters the round of league play, battling for a chance at the league title with the hardest part of the schedule remaining. Thank That's you. All. <laughs>
Thank you. And I think we have maybe somebody here from Watsonville High tonight. Herman, come on up. Do you have some good news for us? Uh, yeah, I'll mention it in a second. Okay. <laughs> there's, a, there's a spot for it, don't worry. So once again, and as always, welcome. This is Watsonville High School's board presentation on the day of today. Ooh, ooh, it's not working. Is there a reason? It's not working. I believe in you. Oh, there we go. <laughs> So yeah, once again, and as always, my name is Herman Rafael Gonzalez, representative of Watsonville High School, and at the request of my ASB teacher, I'll be including now Stanford Class of 2026 and one of 300 of this year's Gates Millennium Scholars. So, wow. yes, 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 yes. I felt a little embarrassed saying that, but my ASB teacher was like, you gotta tell them, you gotta. <laughs> So I was like, you know, that's I agree. awesome. Thank you. Starting off, as always, with our athletics. So all of our athletic teams are going strong once again. We have baseball, volleyball, track and field, lacrosse, softball, and swimming. And I'm not sure about golf, but this season is always jam packed. So last night we celebrated boys volleyball senior night in a game against Soledad that despite the first set getting really, really dicey, they caught up in the second, third, and fourth set, taking the win. We're also moving on to track and field league finals this coming Friday with, um, I believe, a PCA, PCAL mission tournament yesterday that quite a few of our um, track and field members placed quite high on with two. A uh, very notable and upcoming freshman, Rodrigo Barranco, and I forgot his last name, but his first name is Isaiah. They're both two very, 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 yeah. That's a quick question. Do we still have a tennis team? Uh, we don't have a boys tennis team, but we have a girls tennis team that um, played during the fall season. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so, so we still have tennis, but just not in the season. Uh, lacrosse has also continued competing, winning a large portion of their games. And baseball, like the rest of our teams, have begun competing, going to different schools, all of that. Big shout out to Watsonville High School's very own Jasmine Navarro and Giancarlo, who's a sophomore, for placing top three in their respective events this month and in different, different times, too. So that was always, always, always impressive. I, didn't, I wasn't able to include a picture of our softball team, but I want to give a shout out to them. And uh, they're, as always, really promising. They won league last year, and so high hopes for them this year. Moving on with what we're doing right now, how life is going on at Watsonville High School. Uh, today we celebrated Denim Day. I'm quite less formal, a lot less formal than how I usually am, but that is because today is Denim Day, a day in Sexual Assault Awareness Month um, that is so supposed to um, be a sort of representative movement against the uh, ideas of um, blaming victims when it comes to sexual assault. And really the purpose of celebrating this day and celebrating this month and recognizing this month is to make sure and ensure that all of the students and survivors at Watsonville High School understand that they feel supported, uh, understand that they are supportive and that supported and that the resources are there for when they need it. In these past two weeks, Watsonville High School 11th and 12th graders have also continued with, I believe it's our, either SBAC testing or CAS testing, SBAC, correct? Uh, yeah, and testing has taken place via this modified schedule that we have with uh, a very, very, very long advisory happening on Tuesdays and Thursdays with most of our 11th graders and 12th graders um, finishing the tests. Makeup sessions are going to be provided next week, but uh, I would say a large portion of our class has of the two classes have completed their standardized testing. Following that, every single fall, hundreds of Watsonville High School students put themselves through the terrible experience that is AP exams, which I am also unfortunately a part of. We're all stressing out, reviewing like crazy, uh, but we're getting it done, so wish us luck. Following this, we have prom. As of this moment right now, we are approximately 70 hours away from Watsonville High School's prom, and this is going to be one of the largest proms that we've had in the history of Watsonville High School with almost 500 people in attendance. So we're taking real a lot of precautions when it comes to COVID-19, ensuring that uh, people get a test if they need it, and ensuring that as many people wear their mask as possible. So we're trying to keep this very safe and sober as well, as we always do. 
Um, and we're also including a lot of things at our prom sort of deal. While the ticket is $100, it's definitely worth it because we have a taquero, DJ, banda, a dessert bar, a ton of different selfie stations, a 360 photo booth, a full dinner, and much, much more. So this is one of the biggest events that we've hosted all year, and it's definitely one of the most exciting. There's rumbles of people like, oh, I'm getting my dress. Oh, this is, my, this is the color of my dress. We have an Instagram page for um, where people submit their dresses so that no one wears the same dress twice. And <laughs> it's like, it's, it's massive. It's a massive deal. And we have guests from all over the district, from I think every single school, every single high school in this district also in attendance. So this is incredibly exciting. Uh, I just want to give a shout out to some upcoming events that aren't necessarily planned exactly by ASB. On Cinco de Mayo, Watsonville High School is going to be celebrating El Cinco de Mayo with a food day sale and a car show like as is tradition that we were not able to do last year, but now we're back. On the 6th of May, the Spanish department is hosting their, celebra their celebration for Dia de la Madre and El Dia del Niño y de la Niña. And so we're celebrating that. The Spanish department is putting that on. I'm helping out with my AP Spanish language class. And um, I believe uh, Professor, uh, Professor Pozo is going to be helping out with his AP Spanish literature class. So we're all just coming together for different things. And as always, thank you. Thank you, Herman. We're very, very proud of you. Congratulations on that, that unbelievable Gates Millennium Scholarship. Yeah. Th that pays for all four years, right? Yeah. Hold on. Should I go to the mic? Or? Yeah, come on up. <laughs> this is why, this is the things that I live for. This is why I'm on this board, is to hear about these things that you're about to say. Thank you. We're very proud of you. Yeah. They're going to pay for all four years and books and. Uh, some study abroad trips and some, um, you know, if, if I ever need a flight, they're going to fly me to and back from places, so it's been crazy. So it's just really exciting. You worked really hard, and, yeah. and you deserve it. Thank and you're a very bright individual, and you're going to go really far. Thank you. Okay. And I'm also excited to, especially because I feel as if Watsonville and the community of Watsonville has such a interesting story. I wrote like half of my college essays about the history of Watsonville and the, the sort of town and just I'm really excited to take what I know about this town and how I can help this town and bring it to a higher level which is I think really important. And Have fun. What I want to do. Yeah. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Bye bye. Another one. Okay. Thank you. Next up is item 4.1, approval of agenda. I'm looking for a motion. I move to approve. Um, may I? Sorry. Um, mm -hmm. If I can make a, a request, I had a request from the community if we could also um, place um, 9.6, um, if we could place 9.6 um, directly after 6.2. Um, we have several community members that are here for 9.6. I'd appreciate the modification to the agenda, please. Okay, so, so I amend my initial motion with the changes of moving item 9.6 6 right after 6.2. A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Next is, I'm hoping, the approval of minutes. So we're on item 5.1, approval of the March 23rd, 2022 board meeting minutes. I move to approve. All second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes, I think, unanimously. Um, item 5.2, the approval of our April 20th, 2022 special board meeting minutes. I move to approve. All second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. 7-0. Thank you. Um, next up, we have item 6.1, and this is a presentation on update on current um, trends of crime um, for young people. And we have two guest speakers tonight. Um, they're both named Noe. So you guys want to come up to the podium? There's Noe. Stand out here so we can kind of get the whole crowd, or what would you like? 
Well, you could just be up here because there, there's a TV camera actually that's recording this and streaming it for us. So you'll be on live tonight and then it'll go in recordings too. You can grab the microphone. Yeah. You, well, you're going to present to us. You have to present oh, to the board. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're presenting to us. This, oh, so this was my request because I know that there's been a lot of gang activity because I work at a hospital in Salinas and we're seeing a lot more young people come in with injuries coming from Watsonville area, right? So I asked for this to be presented tonight because I think as a board member and as a mother and as somebody who cares about our community, we're all super concerned because we feel like it's maybe escalating, but we weren't sure. So we wanted to hear directly from you. Um, so raise your hand if you're Noe Rocha. I'm Noe Rocha. Noe Rocha works for Santa Cruz County. He is a supervisor in the district attorney's office. So I work for the uh, Santa Cruz County District Attorney's Office and I am currently assigned as a supervisor for the Santa Cruz County anti crime team, which is a countywide team uh, that's made up of different agencies throughout the county to tackle drugs and gangs primarily within our county. That's great. And your partner here is Noe Hernandez, and Noe works for the Watsonville PD, and he's assigned to the Special Investigation Unit. Special Investigation Unit. Basically, we're the internal Watsonville Police Department's gang team, narcotics team, violence suppression team, but we're also very uh, big on doing community events. So we do a lot of speaking, and we go to schools and do a lot of volunteer work also within the department. Yeah, so I'm so sorry, you're going to have to talk right in the microphone or else our community won't be able to hear you. I apologize. And there's like reporters watching this that are going to report out on this tomorrow, etc. So I just heard, a, last night I watched the entire Watsonville City Council meeting because I was waiting to hear our agenda item, which came last last night, so I watched the whole meeting. But I saw, I think your assistant chief give a, a presentation about the crime rates in um, Watsonville. So anyway, so we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you for being here tonight. We appreciate Thank it. You. And if you would just speak right into that mic so that the community can hear you. Thank you. And I understand it's going to be about, uh, our gap is about 30 minutes, so we'll try to cover as much as possible. We really crunched this presentation down. Uh, so again, what we're going to cover today, it's going to be uh, gangs, general gang information within the uh, city of Watsonville. And uh, we'll discuss the uh, current uh, crime trends within the city, and we'll speak uh, about uh, some of the current gangs that we have in the city. Um, uh, primarily, we'll, we'll cover the uh, locations where the uh, what we call as strongholds or hangout areas uh, for, of s these several gangs uh, within the city are. That way, the uh, school is kind of aware um, in case a situation arises. Um, so we'll start with the. Uh, Norteño gangs, um, we have about eight gangs here in the city of Watsonville. Um, and there is the list. Uh, I'll get into the specifics as we go through the slides. So we'll talk about the uh, common Watson and Norteño uh, gangs. Um, here you can see to the left, there is a letter N representing the, uh, that specific gang. And then the uh, Mayan symbol, the number 14. You see the two lines uh, followed by uh, four dots above, and then the letter N, and then a large strawberry. Um, so those are common signs or symbols, tattoos, that uh, some of our gang members, specifically associated to Norteños, will uh, utilize to represent their affiliation. So what's important about this is that I think it's important for school educators to uh, recognize this. In case they see this, we can hopefully stop uh, this sort of behavior before it gets any any worse. And again, some more common Watsonville Norteño gang uh, tattoo signs or symbols. Um, w some of the most common colors or hats that we see here that are sometimes more associated to the, uh, the specific Norteño gangs. It's going to be the letter W, uh, the hat with the letter with the uh, letter W or the uh, letter C, um, and then obviously the uh, color red. And then the uh, Willow Bird, which they've adopted to represent their uh, gangster ideology. So we'll start with the first gang. Uh, we'll start from the southern part of uh, Watsonville, and we'll, more, we'll move uh, up north. Um, and then uh, this is the uh, local park, Watson uh, Stronghold. This is the river uh, park. This is over by the levee area, right at the border of. Uh, 
Monterey County and Santa Cruz County. Um, this is where you get the majority of uh, this uh, gang members uh, congregating. And then some of the specific uh, hats or symbols that they've adopted themselves, the specific gang, uh, you're gonna get a lot of uh, uh, hats with the letter P or clothing with the letter P. And that's again uh, uh, associated to local park, the P for the park. So that's important again for educators to see somebody um, that begins to change their appearance and wearing red hats and stuff like that, and they live in the neighborhood. Um, not necessarily doesn't mean that they're gang members or anything like that, but they're, they might be beginning to gravitate towards that. And then some other common tattoos associated to this specific gang, obviously the uh, LP for the local park. And sometimes you might see uh, specific digits and you try to figure out what those numbers mean. Um, and at first glance, you don't know what it means. Um, if you look at the telephone keypad, you look at the 579, and if you look at the uh, regular telephone keypad, it'll stand for LPW, the name of the gang. So you will get that sort of combination, not just for this gang, but for every other gang uh, within Watsonville, safe to say. Um, so some of the uh, gangs, um, they go as far as to uh, threaten other people, police officers, um, and this is some of the uh, taggings that you will uh, see. Um, any opportunity, they'll cross the uh, the name of the rival, uh, whoever they view as a rival, whether it's a rival gang member or uh, or even police authority in general. And now moving uh, up north uh, through the city, then you got the uh, city hall Watson. Uh, the stronghold is Grant Street, uh, 140 West Beach area. This is a little bit closer to Watsonville High School area. Um, and uh, like I said, primarily Grant Street, Maple Street, that area there. And some of their common uh, uh, clothing and apparel, uh, the hockey team, they've adopted the uh, uh, CH from that team, uh, the, the Canadian yeah, hockey team. And then they've adopted the uh, baseball, White Sox, Chicago White Sox. If you look at the scoreboard during a baseball game, you'll see there the, uh, I believe it's CHW. So they use that to represent this game. You also see many of them uh, utilizing the uh, champion logo to represent the C and the H. And we've been noticing a lot of the new members uh, utilizing the city of Watsonville bird to represent the city hall uh, gang. So a lot of times you'll see that within their tattoos or drawings and at first glance it doesn't seem like much it just means like they're representing the city of Watsonville well it's m more associated to City Hall what's on uh, gang and again going back to the tattoos uh, C stands for city H for hall and then they get a little uh, uh, pretty smart uh, they'll if you read that in Spanish say H doble U translates to C-H-W. So at first glance, you might be like, what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. Um, if, you see, if you see it in the uh, rival's neighborhood, it doesn't mean anything until you start paying attention and you interpret a little more into it. And then from that, uh, we keep moving uh, north, and then you get to the Rodriguez Street area. Um, Rodriguez Street, 5th Street, 6th Street area. That's where you get the uh, WVN, what's on Barrio. Norte or the uh, Rodriguez Street uh, stronghold. Um, and there you go, WVN for Watson Barrio Norte, Locos, RST, Rodriguez Street, subset. And then a common uh, piece of clothing that they've been, uh, that I've been noticing within the last few years um, is the Houston Rockets hat for Rodriguez Street. So I've seen that uh, by many of the, uh, these uh, participants, members, associates. I've also seen them uh, uh, tattooed on their face and stuff like that. So that's one of the more uh, current trends. And again, that's another tattoo associated to that specific gang, um, in addition to the Rodriguez Street tattoo on the right. And then here's a uh, recent tagging uh, at the cemetery by this gang. Uh, 
you can read it there. 187 is the penal code for for murder uh, in the state of California. So they u utilize that to threaten officers and then uh, uh, disrespect the task force that we belong to or the uh, anti-crime team. So they've gone as far as to uh, vandalize sacred grounds and stuff like that. And this is, I believe it was uh, late last year. And the uh, next gang, as you move up north, it's gonna be the north side uh, Chicos. Um, some of their strongholds recently have been the Ataqueria Mi Tierra, Mariscos, Nagarita area. Um, Ataqueria Mi Tierra, that's the one at the old uh, uh, Kmart shopping center. And then uh, Mariscos, Nagarita, that is over by East Lake. And some of their uh, clothing that they utilize, it's the Chicago uh, Cubs, the C for uh, Chicos. And then they have a clothing line uh, that it's associated to them. Um, and it's never scared. And uh, the way I interpret it is uh, the N stands for north and the scared S for side. And then some of the, uh, unfortunately, they've adopted some of our mascots that we have at our local uh, high schools. Watson High School, this gang has adopted the Wildcat. Uh, to represent this specific gang. The next gang up north is going to be the Clifford Manor Locals, and that's primarily the uh, 240 block of uh, Clifford, um, over by Main Street, between Main Street and Freedom. And again, they also have a clothing line, uh, Locals Gang, with a symbol of, of uh, AK-47 in the middle of it. And again, uh, they've adopted the uh, the block W from our high school, from Watson High School. <clears throat> so it's not uncommon to see a member of this gang to have a large block W somewhere on their body, um, which makes it a, a little bit easier for us to identify who, uh, what specific gang this person belongs to. Next street up north is gonna be the Landis Street, which is across from Taqueria Mi Tierra, Kmart Shopping Center, and that's Landis Avenue, the dead end of it. The name of the gang is uh, Landis Street. And uh, some other common uh, clothing items. It's gonna be the St. Louis uh, Cardinals uh, for Landis Street. And then St. Louis Cardinals uh, symbol used as tattoo to represent that gang also. Next gang up north is going to be the uh, Vardar Green Valley VGV. Um, this is a little unique to the uh, Norteño gangs within our city because not only do they utilize the uh, color red, they've also added the color green to it. So it won't be uncommon for you to see uh, somebody wearing all green um, and displaying gang uh, tattoos. Um, so again, yeah, not only are they using, utilizing the color red, they're also utilizing the color green. And some of the apparel that they wear is the Green Bay Packers to represent Green Valley uh, gang or the Oakland A's because of the color green. Again, in addition to the color red. And there you see again uh, the G, the Green Bay Packers uh, G implemented into their uh, gang culture. And then the uh, last gang within Watsonville, it's, it's more a uh, SO jurisdiction, county jurisdiction, but it's the Mesa Village, and that's uh, Stronghold is over at the, ironically, it's over at the uh, uh, Sheriff's Office uh, Park area, um, and it's called the Mesa Village. And just like every other Norteño gang in the city, <clears throat> they uh, utilize the same color symbols pretty much to represent their gang. And some of the tattoos, uh, MV for Mesa Village, which is that specific area within the neighborhood. Uh, we have a video, we're, we're gonna skip that just in the interest of time. And uh, now we're gonna get into the Sudeño gangs in Watsonville. So, two uh, main Sudeño gangs in Watsonville, Port, si port side uh, Chicos and Mexican side Locos. Uh, 
a lot less gangs than the Norteño gangs that we have, so they're diminished to a smaller number. <clears throat> you see uh, the strawberry symbolizing they're still from Watsonville, but they've cut it, colored it in a color blue instead of a red because they'll never put a red tattoo on their body. Uh, there's the Watson with the 1-3. Uh, the Sureño gangs identify with the uh, number 13, which is the 13th letter in the alphabet, uh, which represents the uh, Mexican Mafia, which, which oversees the uh, Sureño gangs. Uh, NK, which uh, stands for Norteño Killer, um, common tattoo you'll see on Sudeño gang members. And then uh, you see the tattoo on the left that has a, like a, hum a, like a cartoonish human, but it has three dots on the, uh, the closure of the hat symbolizing the three dots for uh, poor side. Uh, Buster Free, uh, Sudeños commonly uh, call Norteños busters, so he, they're basically claiming that they will never associate with the Norteño. Uh, X3, which is the Roman numeral for uh, 13, another common tattoo for uh, Sureño gang members. Uh, the stronghold uh, in the area of Rodriguez Street and Front Street, which is commonly called the Mona Lisa. The building's still there. Uh, there's no business or anything there, but that's one of the main strongholds for the Sureño gang members, which is the southern part of Watsonville. And then another one was the Discount Mall. Uh, they had such a stronghold that people were afraid to go shop there because they'd go in there and they'd basically either get their items taken away from them, money taken away from them. It's slowed down quite a bit now, but it's still considered um, a stronghold for poor side or Sureño gangs. Jardines del Valle, that's uh, Murphy. It's a migrant camp um, off of uh, Riverside and Murphy's Crossing. Uh, they're a migrant community, so they, their parents go to Mexico. When uh, work ends here, sometimes the children stay, and the, they don't have a lot of supervision, so what do they do is they start associating, and that's how you get the majority of the Sereños in that camp becoming gang members. And then Tierra Alta, which is also the Sheriff's Office jurisdiction, off of Buena Vista by the old, uh, the old dump um, in the county. Uh, that's historically been a Sureño gang territory ever since it was built. Um, up until now, uh, they've tried to create different subsets for Sureño gangs, but poor side, what's on, I think is still the strongest holding there. We might have an emerges, emerging uh, Sureño gang from this area. Um, it seems like they're trying to create a new subset of Sureño, so you might see new. Uh, if you ever see anything associated to Tierra Alta, it's possibly a new gang that's forming from that area. 295 San Andres, it's another uh, migrant community where they're, the, they're mainly field workers that migrate from, they come here for the work season and then go to Mexico and they leave their children here because they're 15, 16, 17 years old. Um, there's another stronghold for poor side. Uh, we've seen a lot of activity from this area uh, we followed a lot of cars going there and uh, realized that they're coming from our local schools and then they're going there and they're being followed by older gang members and all of a sudden we see these kids wearing the clothing that we put out and they're starting to show the, the signs of becoming, associating with the gang. These are pictures of one of their meetings that they've had. Um, sometimes they post them on social media wherever we get a hold of them. And this is just when they have their meetings, they show their tattoos, they show they're proud of being a gang member, they, they show their gang signs. Firearms. And firearms. Uh, they associate with the color blue. Uh, P for a poor side. That's really common. Um, even though it's a P like local park would wear, it's a different one. They, these associate, these are the pirates, right? The, these the are pirates. the pirates. What is it? Pittsburgh pirates. Pittsburgh pirates. So, you probably would never see a, a Norteño wearing a Pittsburgh pi Pirates hat because Sureños associate with this actual team. Here are some tattoos. Poor side in the middle. What's um, important about tattoos, like some of the other t tattoos we saw earlier, there's a lot of hidden symbols. You really got to pay attention. And uh, as a teacher, as an educator, maybe even the drawings, if you pay attention to the pictures, the drawings, uh, you might get some insight of, of kind of where they might be going or 
gravitating to. Um, and I think that's a good way to start um, stopping them before they, they, they move forward. As you can see on, on this particular tattoo, poor side, the dice would symbolize a 1, 3, which is a 13. Uh, there's another three dots above it. There's a three dots on the clown's face. So everything that they do, they have to add a little bit of what they believe in, which they believe in their gang. Pajaro uh, has always been, uh, since I can remember since I was a kid, the biggest stronghold for Sureño gangs, which is right over the bridge. Uh, you cross the county line into Monterey County, and the biggest stronghold is poor side on, in, in Pajaro for uh, gangs. Mexican side locals. I'm oh, sorry, Mexican side locals. They, they associate with the Hecho in Mexico symbol, which is like a brand that was created, and then it's put on a lot of products that come from Mexico. You'll see that tattoo a lot. Um, I've seen it on high school students where they draw it on their binder, and I, I just wonder if they're drawing it because they like it or they're drawing it because they're already associating with, with uh, Mexican side locos. They also associate with the color blue. And MSL, which is Mexican side locos. We're going to skip that video also. Yeah. Here's uh, two people that were detained and in possession of firearms in their waistband, loaded firearms when they were detained, um, also Southerners. So this one's going to be hard to see, but uh, there's firearms concealed within the vehicle. Hard to see. It's going to be underneath the uh, cup holder. Um, skip to the next photo. Uh, you can probably see the firearm on the right-hand side a little bit better there. Um, so they're concealing these firearms. There you go in the uh, threshold of the uh, door jam, revolver in there. And firearms in the engine compartment behind the stereo system. And then underneath the, uh, the dashboard, underneath the driver side. And why are we showing all these firearms? Um, so for me, I've been in law enforcement for about 12 years. I was part of a, the Santa Cruz County Anti-Crime Team as a Watsonville police officer before, for three years. I worked for Watsonville before I went to the DA's office. And being on the force for three years, I don't think I've seen as many guns I've, as I am now seeing on the street, being back on the same task force that I'm on now. Um, it seems like it exploded like three times the amount of guns that I used to see back between uh, 2004 to 2007, the amount of guns I see now, it's crazy, crazy how many more guns I see now. Um, and one of the biggest issues that we have now, as you may have already heard, news media uh, is a problem with the uh, ghost guns. We have a lot of ghost guns, not only in Watsonville, but throughout the entire state, I think throughout the United States. Um, and, and we're seeing it here in our city. Like I said, there's tons and tons of guns here in the city, uh, a lot of them being ghost guns. We're taking them off uh, kids, not even 18 years old. And part of the problem is that they're so easy to uh, get a hold of. And then uh, sometimes when we remove these guns from, uh, from the kids, uh, because of the way the laws are sometimes written, they don't, uh, they don't spend a lot of time in jail, and there's very little consequence sometimes. Uh, but to talk more about the uh, ghost guns, if you can explain to them uh, what that means. And then we got a couple of uh, examples of ghost guns that we can show you guys. Uh, we'll handle them, but we'll show them to you. They're totally safe and unloaded. If anybody has any issues, we'll leave them in the uh, case. We won't show them. But if nobody uh, minds, I'll, I'd like to show you guys. So the common trend right now is uh, they're, con they're called P80s. They're basically a piece of plastic you can buy online for about $150. It ships to your house. Uh, it's considered a piece of plastic. It's a, almost a complete a lower of a firearm. It comes with the, uh, a jig that you put together, and it comes with drill bits. You basically take a drill, and you drill off a couple little pieces. You drill three holes, and then you insert all the parts for a firearm. Now you have a working firearm. And so, you get these parts. so you can order everything to build a firearm online and you don't need to do a background check, you don't need to do any of that stuff because it's not a complete firearm. So the re I, I wanna say about 80% of the firearms we're taking off the street now are this type of firearm because I can order it right now, it'll be at my house by Tuesday. I order all the, inter the internal parts, they all come 
disassembled, so they're not considered a firearm. I build it in less than an hour, and I have a working firearm. There's no serial number, there's no way to track it, that's why the term ghost gun comes in. There's no way to track these firearms. There's no way to track their purchases. Unfortunately, it's, it's out of our hands. We cannot do anything about it. We can't stop people from ordering them. We get the end result of getting them once they're loaded, completed, or when they, someone commits a crime with them. Um, we have two examples of them. We have one as it, it's been modified already, but it has the ships. It's just a piece of plastic. And then we have another one that's a completed firearm. And both of them were taken off the street. Um, can I get a, before we continue, what, do we have a time check? Is anyone keeping the time? Yeah, we have about 10 minutes. Okay, so 10 more minutes. So yep. what I really wanted this presentation to cover mm -hmm. was um, what the data is that we're seeing and, and what we're doing to prevent. So I don't know if you guys are prepared tonight to give us that. I, I, I did not know we were going to get an education about gangs tonight, which yeah, is fine. Goes, but I don't have any, we don't have any numbers with us. Okay. Um, I, well, I think your your assistant chief had it last night. I actually saw a great presentation last night. But, um, but we don't, I mean, I think a lot of us know a lot about gangs. We all, we know a lot about ghost guns. Um, I'm, I'm going to be following up with the next steps yeah. at, at this exact presentation. So after they're done, I'll quickly go over the next steps that we're doing with the task force. Okay. Okay, C carry on. So with that being said, would you like to, asked us to bring some samples of a ghost gun. Is anybody opposed to it, to showing the partial? Well, we'll walk them aware. in front of you. You they, don't have they to handle them. They, they're aware. Okay. This is, this is the way it ships to your house. It's called a polymer 80. And it comes as a piece of plastic. It has a, a couple ridges here that have to be shaved down, but it comes with a jig where you can't make a mistake and overcut it. Once it's shaved down to this point, you drill two holes there, this was pre-drilled, you insert a trigger assembly, and then all you need is put a slide over it, and it locks right in place, and within less than an hour you can have a working firearm made out of a piece of plastic that costs $150, that's shipped right to your house without any background check. This crowd, I, I wouldn't want to show the actual part of it. It's totally unloaded. You can just, yeah, you won't have to take it out. But uh, it just comes basically, this is this was at some point a ghost So this gun. is the exact the piece of plastic that I had in my hand. It's been completed with the trigger assembly, all the internal parts, a slide, a barrel. And it's a functioning farm that we've already uh, test fired. Questions. We're here to answer any questions. Uh, we might not be uh, might have the answer. Might have to be back later. And Do we have any speakers to this item? Thank you very much. It was super interesting. We might have some speakers who want to come up to the podium and ask, and they have yes. they're going to address first, and then and then the board might may have questions for you guys. Yeah, so we don't have the speakers to this item. Okay. Is there any board questions or discussion? Uh, Daniel Dodge Jr. Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, being here. Just a, a quick question. With the violence that we've been seeing in Watsonville, um, do we see, it, would you be able to say if it's organized or just random? As far as uh, what violence the... Or, uh, you know, I, I know an incident, someone was uh, killed on Riverside Road. So I won't speak about the case itself. Oh, yeah, just, so, the, just yeah. in general, yeah. But for the most part, gangs are very organized. Um, so seldomly, in my experience, working gangs, uh, does a crime just occur because of the moment? I mean, it does happen, but typically uh, for gangs, there's a way of operating. There's an organization. And uh, for the most part, it's organized. And yes, we have that uh, organization here in the city of Watsonville. Yeah, um, but you know, just like, you know, 
like I said, not into the specifics, but like Riverside, you know, what happened behind Target, you know, just things like that. Yeah, like I said, for the most part, um, these groups of uh, gang associates or participants, yeah. there's some sort of an organization and uh, there's some sort of planning that goes on before something like that, something major happens. Um, not to say that sometimes it doesn't happen on, on any given moment, but for the most part, they're very well organized. Thank you. I'll just tell you, based on the two specific incidents that you asked about, unfortunately, there's still ongoing investigations, so we can't discuss details about them, especially because there's, there's stuff that still we, need to, we still need to look into. So we apologize, we can't give you any more than that. Trustee Shocker. So the ghost guns, um, are these things that kids can be ordering off of Amazon on their parents' accounts? Certain not parts. I'm sorry. Not, not specifically from Amazon, um, directly from the website from P80, Polymer 80. Um, they're really uh, easily accessible as long as they're in stock. Okay. Uh, there has been a big like influx of orders into that website, which is actually down the website a couple times because people have figured out it's so easy to build them why not order 10 of them and then sell them for a thousand dollars so there's clues that parents can watch for um anything children anything polymer 80 uh wolf industries are the most common uh, uh manufacturers that people are ordering to build these guns there is some parts that you can order on amazon for uh polymer handguns Okay. But mainly it's going to be coming from, uh, it's mainly going to be coming from Polymer 8 or Wolf Industries. Okay. And the guns that lately have been coming off the streets, um, have they been mostly ghost guns? You I want to say a good 80% of what we're getting are ghost guns because it's easier to acquire a ghost gun or, or build it yourself than to try to buy a, a actual serialized gun. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. for Can you explain what you mean by stronghold? Because you guys showed a lot of different areas yeah. and some of them were businesses, so I want to apologize yeah. to those business owners. <laughs> yes. So, because we want, we want people to continue to go there and not feel scared, yeah. right? So tell us what you mean by strongholds. So strongholds are generally the areas where the gang presence has been observed by us uh, historically and, and actually right now recently. Uh, these are the areas where we tend to uh, observe certain gangs congregating the most at, or in that general area. Thank you. And um, since you guys are on a task force, what are, and maybe Dr. Rodriguez or Kristen can talk to this too, what are the most important factors in trying to keep kids um, out, of the, out of harm's way? For me personally, I'm from Watsonville. I grew up in Watsonville mm -hmm. my whole life. I attended public schools. Uh, almost every public school. I grew up in a migrant household, Buena Vista camp. Um, so for me, I can only speak for myself. Um, what worked for me is uh, having my parents being involved in my school, uh, my education, and keeping tabs on me um, on what I was doing throughout the day, throughout the days. Um, and I think that's where it starts. Uh, our parents have to make uh, the time to, to figure out what it is we're doing and to make sure that we stay on track. Uh, as busy as they are, they got to figure out a way um, to stay on, on top of us. Um, so from my perspective, I think that's where it begins. Um, and then within the school, we need support from the teachers, educators, and so on and so forth, and the rest of the community. Okay. And Noe, number two, do you have anything to add? Yeah. I, I also grew up in Watsonville. Um, my parents' involvement in my school. Sports was huge for me. Um, I was always busy with sports um, and trying to stay uh, good in school because my parents were always on top of me. Uh, I've noticed, I've, I've done a couple presentations at schools. I've noticed that some of the kids feel that they're not supported as far as financially going, like go, going to college. I recently did a presentation at a school where one young man said that he wasn't going to college because his parents couldn't afford it. And my immediate response to him is said, don't, don't worry about the money. I said, there's always grants, there's scholarships. And I've taken him basically as I told him I can be your mentor. I can help you go through this, but I want your school to support you too. So I, I connected him with the teacher, told him what I, had, what I had heard from him, 
And the teacher said, that's not a problem. We're going to start looking into scholarships and all this for them. So I think that they, there's, there's young men and women, or women that feel a lack of support financially because their parents have to work and they feel like they have to go to work right away or they have to do other things to help their family. Um, I fortunately never felt that because I was, I was always in sports. Both my parents worked. They were able to make it work. Um, times are really hard right now for everybody. But I think uh, identifying those kids that are basically on the fence, whether should I go to school and go the right path or uh, I'm not going to be successful anyways. I'm going to go this way. And it's easier to join a gang or go do this instead. Um, I think as educators, if we can target those, those children and, and identify them, I think it's very important. Thank you. I did have, I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Um, you know, and, and to that point, I, 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 um, both Trustee Holm and I are professors and educators. Um, she at Cabrillo College, myself at CSUMB. And to that point of what you said about education um, and, and the affordability and the cost right of higher education we know that, that that's a major issue but um maybe also a lot of pe people in our community both students and parents aren't aware that students can attend cabrillo college or monterey peninsula college or hartnell college for as little as less than 50 dollars a semester so that's something big probably as a message to be communicating on our level as an educational institution as well to give you that knowledge that you know at least it's a starting path right um, and then again, yes, even at the next higher level, the university level, there's so much that is out there. Um, but I did have a question. Mm -hmm. um, in consideration, right, that not necessarily gangs and gang violence doesn't necessarily know boundaries to city limits or county lines, right? And you did speak a bit about that line. That's a really thin line on that bridge, right, between Santa Cruz County and Monterey County. And what we also know is going on in that county, and considering that our district straddles both counties and our service to nearly 20,000 students on a daily basis, what sort of work and efforts are happening between Santa Cruz County, Watsonville PD, and the Monterey County Sheriff's Department that you could maybe speak to for us? So we do share, uh, we do hold meetings with other agencies like Monterey County, uh, Santa Clara uh, County area. And we do hold meetings and we talk about common trends like we did here and we bring up certain things that we've been noticing new tattoos and stuff like that um, so that's that's what we do as 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 law enforcement that's what we do we share information with certain task forces from monterey county and santa clara county um, and we san benito county as well uh, san benito county as well yes we do san benito mm -hmm. county uh, we actually uh we sometimes have San Benito County or the other agencies come to our city and assist us in patrolling the area and do gang suppressions and we do it once in a while also um, because of the pandemic we haven't been able to do it as much as we did it before um, so now as crime starting to pick up we're starting to get back into the groove of uh, how we used to operate um, before uh, part of the pandemic so yes we do collaborate a lot with the uh, uh, neighboring uh, counties to include San Benito Monterey County, Santa Clara County. And, and that's happening regularly, you're saying? It happens, uh, I can tell you that I, uh, at least about once, uh, like quarterly, I would say. At least. Yes, and then there is some, some large gatherings, uh, meetings, um, conferences that we attend, and, and that happens at least once a year. So yeah, it'd be nice Looking if we- Looking at the trends of what's happening, not just at, as well as the state level, the national level, and international level. Uh, correct, correct. Okay. Yes. So I just want to thank both of you for coming and sharing some of these common trends that you see because as you call them, they're common trends that you all see but not necessarily common knowledge to a lot of us outside of this. So I do appreciate you coming and sharing that knowledge with us tonight. Thank you. Both. You're welcome anytime. Uh, I think Dr. Rodriguez has a few comments. Yeah, so um, I, I, I'll just present this. You guys can stand there if you want. But um, so, working with um, with Chief Zamora, with Erica Padilla Chavez from um, PVPSA, and several other members, we've really continued to expand our focus on whole child, whole family, whole community. Um, so, for us, what we know, because I'm going to speak specifically to adolescents now and students. So. What we know is there has been an increase in violent activity at the state, county, and local 
local level, right? Which is one reason why we brought, we asked for this presentation to come forward. Um, we also recognize that it's important to recognize the cause of this behavior. And something when you look at the research is adolescents are in the most vulnerable environments and did experience particularly negative impact from the pandemic. And so a lot of times these level of stress and trauma that the adolescents are, see, are seeing are actually higher than most adults, and they are linked to adverse development, academic um, achievement, health, and the risk of exposure to violence. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what we're going to do with this um, accumulating and cascading effects of the pandemic. So we're seeing these um, that are resulting these risk factors that are clustering together and providing these cascading effects. So we do have a collaboration with PVPSA, Watsonville PD, um, the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office Gang Enforcement Team, and um, Santa Cruz County Probation. And we came up with specifically six things that we're going to work on together in order to um, really limit these cascading effects, um, reduce violence, increase consistency and structure to address dysregulation. So for about 18 months, we had students that were out of the schools in the homes, um, we saw gangs infiltrating um, neighborhoods. Um, they had access to our students that they didn't have access to before because they were at school, um, all in to support student success. So I'm gonna go over these one by one just quickly. So we do believe that this is gonna be a community effort, that it's gonna be a multi-agency collaboration and problem solving um, because we believe this is a multi-system challenge. This isn't a challenge that one of us alone can do. So we have committed to regular collaboration meetings um, about every six weeks. Um, we're gonna look at established actions. For, for example, these, these four remaining actions, did they happen? If not, why not? What additional partners we need to support and next steps? We also have other collaboratives that are constantly working to support, and we're gonna bring these action steps and ideas to the South County Triage. Um, MDT, which is a multidisciplinary team, and also our own Healthy Start Collaborative. Um, we also believe that we have to address the root of the cause. So we are maintaining our additional social emotional supports. Um, we did increase our social emotional counselors by 55%. We increased our mental health clinicians by 210%. And we opened our first family engagement and wellness center. So those supports are going to continue to remain. Um, we are talking specifically to President DeSerpa's question of what do we believe we need to do? We have to focus on excessively truant students. The students that we're finding that are engaging in the activity that where they're being arrested or they're in, uh, committing crimes, many of those students are supposed to be at school during that time. Um, and instead they're at parks, they're at other areas. Um, and so we're gonna reinforce our district wellness team um, with the support of PVPSA's uh, Valor team with bi-monthly meetings. We're also going to implement safety protocols to increase the number of home visits um, because the pandemic did curtail some of our number of student contacts, so we're gonna increase those number of student contacts. Um, Valor, the Valor team's gonna conduct some needs assessments and make sure that we have a plan in place for each one of these students. Um, we also plan to address tardies at the three comprehensive high schools. So just when I did my day in the life as a campus supervisor, um, I saw that really we needed to focus on this. Um, so we had kids come in 30, 45 minutes late from lunch. Um, many of them, as we say, um, as my father used to always say, um, you get into mischief when you have idle time. Um, and so that's why, whether it's sports or other things um, that keep you on the straight and narrow, but we're going to, increase messaging of expectations, have a better process for student accountability, and awareness and notification with parents. We're gonna set a rotation of campus supervisors. We're gonna work with each site leadership team to really discuss the roles of teachers and others in supporting expectations, right? Um, maintain um, better visibility at classroom doors and 
um, do parallel tracks. So we are not giving up on PBIS, but we do need to continue to um, move forward with progressive discipline when necessary because there has to be some consequence and a movement towards getting kids back to regulation, right? So currently there's some dysregulation there and so we need to, to move that forward. Um, we, as I mentioned earlier, we're continuing with the restorative start or restorative spring. Um, we know that we have to hit not only the progressive discipline, but we also have to do restorative practices, which does involve looking at the root cause of why students are doing what they're doing. Maybe it's um, disillusionment, lack of hope for the future of what can be. And so we have a really successful team of behaviorists, mental health clinicians, and social emotional counselors that continue to develop these lessons. Again, they're on set five um, as we speak. And then going back to what both um, officers were talking about is increased family um, engagement. So up top, because I think most people that know about me know I'm a research gal, so up top it kind of speaks to that. Um, and the fact that our parents are instrumental in really making sure um, that they're supporting um, any maladjustment or dysregulation. And so we have a, a Strengthening Family Program grant, um, PVVSA, I'll, I'll, re I'll restate. So PVPSA has a um, Strengthening Families Program grant um, that they are going to support us with um, to provide targeted interventions and wraparound supports to families. Um, it's a series of eight workshops um, that talk about dealing with stress, um, substance abuse, pressures, influences, communication. Um, and it's going to have its original focus um, in the Watsonville High area for that parent um, group. Um, and we really believe that if we do this multi-agency uh, focus that we will support students in becoming regulated with structures and expectations. Um, we will be able to increase their supports, um, their happiness, um, and obviously their academic success. Um, and so we look forward to continuing to support these efforts um, as we move forward. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Yeah. Is that the conclusion of yep, the that's, presentation? That's, okay, that's great. She wrote. That's great. I love that that ending. I want to thank both of you for your the work that you do every day to help keep kids safe, and for educating our community. Um, I think this was. Um, a presentation that was likely hard to watch for many people, but um, important for people to know so that they can recognize the signs and symbols and try to intervene as appropriate. So thank you both for being here um, and talking with us tonight. I, I just have um, one recommendation, and maybe under a request it might be to move forward. I, I think that this agenda item was, I agree with you, tr um, President Trustee Serpa, it was very important and appropriately placed on tonight's agenda. It unfortunately was slated for about a 30 minute um, totality on tonight's agenda and it's about almost an hour in. I would like to request maybe a follow up back, um, both with your teams and other collaborative teams. Um, and, and even if we have to you know, request, come to the board and request maybe a special board meeting to do that, to really give um, the awareness and presence of the time to just have a focus on this because this is a really important topic for our community. So I'd like to make that request and recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to item 6.2, uh, 2022 Extended Learning Summer Offerings. And this is a report by Carol Ortiz. Hi, Carol. Hello. Oh. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, President De Serpa, Superintendent Rodriguez, members of the board. I'm Carol Ortiz, Director of the Extended Learning Department here in PVUSD. Uh, just wanted to make a quick comment on the previous presentation. I'm a, a product of um, Front Street of Mona Lisa neighborhood, and I'm also a product of PVUSD schools, and that is why I do what I do, because I want to provide a safe, supportive place for all of my students in the community before and after school and during summer. So that's why I'm here. I'm going to be sharing information on our summer programs. We're deep into planning our summer programs. We have lots of collaborative um, 
partnerships going on, lots of exciting opportunities for our students going on. This is our summer school schedule. First day of school will be June 13th. Last day will be July 8th with the 4th of July off. We are um, planning to serve approximately 4,000 students and we're also planning our before and after school programs during the summer with the ELO funds. We are very excited about um, piloting that this summer to see how it works for us in our summer program. This is our first year we're offering a six hour summer program as well. So we'll be offering a six hour program in addition to the three hours which will total the nine hour days for the ELO programs. We've also already been in discussions with the transportation department regarding the before and after school programs, have not finalized those times yet. But I'm really um, fortunate and excited to be able to work with transportation. They've been, ve been very flexible and collaborative with us, so I appreciate them. Our high school program is aimed at students in grades 9 to 12 who have Fs. We are finalizing the recommendations with counselors. Um, should be done by tomorrow or yeah, to tomorrow, and we'll be sending out the recommendations to um, families in the next couple weeks. We have the registration process and timeline there on our website, so all families can see what the plan is. We've been doing um, online ingenuity credit recovery with our high school students for about two years now, maybe, and so the processes and procedures are, are pretty well established. Our students know to be checking their emails regularly, which has been very helpful. Um, we're also collaborating with um, the EL, um, ex state and federal programs to offer ELD classes to our students in person as well. And of course, always talking with adult ed for the concurrent enrolled students and summer grads. So we always make sure that if um, students were not able to complete and be successful in our summer credit recovery program, we um, do a warm handoff to adult ed and make sure they get their, their high school diploma completed there. And we've been doing that for um, quite a few years. This is our application flyer for the elementary and middle school students with grades TK to 8. Our theme is Mission Possible. It's the summer, summer um, space kind of NASA thing. We have lots of activities planned out for the, the elementary and middle school students. Hopefully the middle school students like them, but I know the elementary students will. We have lots of um, library materials we've already purchased to, to put out when we hire library media techs over the summer as well. So lots of um, hands-on project activities that students can be doing in their classrooms and also in the libraries. This is what our application looks like. You can find the application online on our, or on our website. The April 15th deadline was for priority enrollment so we can be planning our um, bus routes. Um, but students can continue to enroll all the way up to the last day of school. Of course, families who uh, need to or prefer a printed copy can also request a hard copy either in any of our after school offices or they can call our office and we can either provide them a hard copy or we can actually fill out the application for them. So um, no family should feel deterred if they are unable or, or, un un or don't need to or don't want to fill out an online application. We definitely want to support all families in, in whatever they'd like to do. The next few slides are going to be about um, specifically about the summer programs, the schedules, and the curriculum. This is just an example. Um, the students are going to be rotating between language arts, math, and enrichment. We will be embedding social emotional learning activities in the morning part of the program. So as the students get to school, they will have time for a welcome, class meeting, attendance, activities, warm welcome with the teacher, and then they will be going together as a class to breakfast and recess. We tried that um, the last time we were in person a couple years ago, and it worked out really well because it gave the students a, t a chance to come and settle in in the class and um, feel kind of relaxed with the teacher before they went out to a, as a group to breakfast and recess. And we are, all, as, as you can see, there's before and after school programs planned depending on the start time of each school. So there may be some sites, because they start too early for the summer, will not have an opportunity for, for the be before school program, but we will then offer the three hours after school. Or we would split before and after depending on the sites. So see, we are still working on that. The next couple of slides specifically are about our language arts and math curriculum. Um, we do provide curriculum in Spanish um, to our schools as needed. They all have um, social emotional items integrated 
into the curriculum. We um, bundle materials for the teachers to make it easy for them to access and not have to create any new materials, um, while at the same time not having to necessarily access the classroom materials because some of the sites aren't open, so a teacher may not be teaching at, in their own particular classroom, so we need to be able to give them materials and curriculum and not have to scramble and dig through that teacher's classroom. So we, we try to make it as easy as possible, curriculum-wise, for the teachers. With regards to math specifically, we are partnering with um, Curriculum Instruction Department to provide TNTP to um, a handful of teachers to do some coaching um, and support as part of integrated into their, their day program. We're also working with um, Elevate Math. This is our third year um, offering the Elevate program to our students, our upper middle grade students. We are very, very proud to be collaborating with Migrant Almas program. We've been working with them for quite a few years now. And this is the first year that we're actually integrating the migrant program within our six hour program. In the past, we've had a four hour summer school. So migrant program has been after um, the regular four hour summer school program, but this year they will be integrated into our, our six hour program. Um, the migrant program is very popular. The curriculum is very popular with all of our students. This year, unfortunately, we are not, they were not able to get the, um, by, by national teachers that they have gotten in the past years, but um, we hope to be able to do that next year. But the migrant program has wonderful curriculum and themes that the students focus on, and we're just very happy and proud to partner with Migrant. We always integrate social emotional learning and physical education into our extended learning programs. Based on the successful Camp Connect program last year, we will be offering continued social emotional activities, structured um, social time for the students. We are providing Sparks um, equipment and training to our teachers so that when the kids are out on recess, they have a structured play and um, similar to play works that's happening during the regular day, which we're also hoping to be able to incorporate either during the summer or if not in our after school programs next year. We are very fortunate to have so many community partners um, working with us every year during summer school. These are our um, partners who come and bring the STEAM lessons to all of our after school programs. These professional um, um, organizations offer very high level um, classes and we are very happy that they're coming back to work with us again this year. Um, we just talked to Isabel from LSU STEM a couple days ago and we're talking about um, continuing the youth orchestra over the summer as well. So we have lots, lots going on this summer. We will be offering literacy packs and summer reading challenge, again, uh, in partnership with the Watsonville Public Library. Um, that poster over on the left was actually created by one of our after school staff members who's a graphic artist. Um, we will, um, the, the, I've mentioned this a lot and I'm gonna keep mentioning it, but the, the reading program at the Watson Library is very important to me as someone who participated in it every year, walking from Front Street to the library and then walking back. Um, so we're very happy that um, we have Jen actually who's making those conversations and making sure we have those partnerships. And we are also offering specific um, programs through the ELO um, funding this year. We are also looking at um, seeing what the YMCA and City of Watsonville Parks and Recs um, can work with us on to offer programs that, I mean, they don't necessarily supplant um, what we're doing, but maybe they're just flexible programs that families need something different than what we may be offering them um, during summer. And I think that's it. And I just wanted to thank everyone, uh, thank the board for your ongoing support of the extended learning department. Um, the department has been in existence for 24 years. I've only been with it for maybe 10 or so, but um, the department started as two people, the director and Anna Hernandez, who's a fiscal analyst, she's still there. The, d the board invested money into the extended learning department. After two years, it became an independent grant funded department, did not need uh, general fund money anymore. And it's been investing, um, and it brings in $10 million in grants every year to support all of these programs. And I just wanted to thank the board for that support. Thank you for the 
for the personal um, disclosures at the beginning, mm -hmm. you know, it, it makes a difference to feel connected to the kids that you're working with. And thank you for letting us know the history, how it started with just two people mm -hmm. and now brings in 10 million e a year. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. so thank you, that was a great presentation. Do we thank have you. any speakers? We do not. Any questions or comments from the board, Jen? Um, I just wanted to acknowledge the work and the progress that I, you know, I've seen, you know, especially in our, our summer learning programs, you know, my, my older kids, you know, they had done with, and it was great for, you know, catching them up on their schoolwork. And what I noticed, you know, my, you know, my own student, you know, went through the, the summer program last year. And what I was thought was particularly remarkable, it, it addressed the, the learning needs, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it also addressed the connection to school and, and the love of learning that was real that that under that, that foundation mm -hmm. that he needed to be successful this year and like mm -hmm. watching you know seeing how these programs expand so like thank you for you know all of the curriculum development that happened all the coordination that had to happen between all the schools i you know from a, a board trustee perspective from a mother's perspective you know just and as a you know see, knowing how that ripples out into our community like thank you to everybody you know who's involved in making these programs work because mm -hmm. they are working mm -hmm. and it's giving our students you know an opportunity for you know just a, a brighter future and so thank you thank you appreciate that thank you thanks trustee holm trustee shocker i just wanted to say thank you i know a lot of kids think about summer school as oh no i have to continue school but at pvusd that's not the case mm -hmm. um summer school is fun I visited Camp Connect last year at Cesar Chavez, and the kids were so excited to be creating paper mache art and just being with each other and having that, that support. So I think that um, we have one of the best after school programs and summer school programs in the state, and we're probably an envy of a lot of other districts. Um, so I encourage parents to definitely take a look at what we're offering. Their kids will learn, they'll have fun, and they'll be begging for more. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Tristia Costa. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that, um, uh, as well, chime in on what my um, colleagues have said, is that I am so grateful to see all the collaborative um, community partnerships and relationships, particularly with the city of Watsonville, as well, uh, the library. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> library don't want libraries to become extinct, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and it, it also goes back to even what we just saw in the uh, previous presentation, yeah. right? This is really about community collaboration. None of us in this community, right? The school district, the city of Watsonville, the police department, the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department, none of us are just an island to ourselves, mm -hmm. right? We all are part of this community and having that collaboration and working together as we again saw in the previous presentation as well as with yours is so imperative and important that we are building those community partnerships that we're working together for the betterment of our community mm -hmm. um, meaning our students our families right all of those because we're all part of this together so mm -hmm. thank you so mm -hmm. much thank you thank you mm -hmm. okay Daniel Dodge jr. Um, I just also want to saying thank you you know I, I haven't been here that long but just the short time that I've been here and, and the things that I've seen you do uh, you have you have a big heart you know you, you you believe in our city you believe in our people our students um, Pajaro Valley Unified School District and, and you know your staff mm -hmm. you know we, you know when even when COVID was still around you know you guys were out there mm -hmm. so i just wanted to say thank you very much and summer school actually looks fun so thank, thank you <laughs> okay thank you carol oh sorry uh, tristia rosco has questions <laughs> you were being so quiet i was like what is wrong oh, over I was here thinking, you know it's exciting <laughs> it's summer <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> right <laughs> a little a little bit of break <laughs> um Going back to the previous presentation um, and just filling in the gaps. Mm -hmm. So summer school ends July 8th mm -hmm. and we don't go back to school until August. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if there's uh, some work in progress to fill in those gaps. Mm -hmm. You did mention the partnership with um, Watsonville, city of Watsonville. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm wondering 
if there's some work or a process we can have in place to be able to refer families mm -hmm. or even have staff like the rec leaders come present mm -hmm. and give that as an option. Mm -hmm. I do know that most of the programs are fee-based. Mm -hmm. So are we as a district going to help with that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm not sure if we've thought about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have actually. Um, it, it's a it's a tough balance because on one hand we want to and need to provide opportunities to families during that time. Um, that is a whole month, uh, and at the same time we also want to and need to prov need to provide an opportunity to for a break for staff. Yeah, exactly. um, it's 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 really hard not for the for staff. It's like office staff and you know the the. Mm -hmm school site staff, transportation, food services, all the people who work almost year round to give them a little bit of break in between, right? Just a little bit of time before we start back up in August. So it's def that's definitely on my mind. Um, so it's a, it's a matter of having conversations, like you said, with our community partners and seeing how, um, how we balance the, the funding opportunities because we, we can't necessarily supplant or pay for things like child care or like specific services like that, but we can work with community organizations to offer programs to families, but not necessarily say, I'm paying for your fee, you know what I mean? So we have to be really cautious about how we, um, how we offer services and um, spend the monies with the grants that we have while keeping in mind that there's that, um, that a community need. There's always a different type of community need no matter what. and that one month is um, is always the kind of the tough, sweet little spot right there. But it's definitely something that, that we've, we've talked about. And actually, um, Jen Bruno um, is very close with the city of Watsonville, so Parks and Rec, but also the PAL program um, that's over on Rodriguez Street and YMCA. And we haven't necessarily worked as closely with the YMCA because of COVID this last year, but that's another opportunity to say like, okay, we're not gonna pay necessarily for specific families' fees, but how are we gonna provide some type of opportunities for families to utilize the program? You know what I mean? Just Carol, take the tough balance. Dr. Rodriguez has a comment. And so I think that the reason probably for the question was that some lines were blurred because we had some flexibilities during COVID that mm -hmm. we don't necessarily continue on. So during COVID time when we did have all schools closed, we had some of that ability to pay for slots at YMCA and other areas. Mm -hmm. Those flexibilities have since ceased. So there was flexibility. So I just wanted to mention that because you might be thinking like, well, we used to do it, so mm -hmm. why not? Mm -hmm. um, and so I just wanted to mm -hmm. mention that point. And then Ms. Chouse mm -hmm. has a comment on top of my comment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I do, just one more piece. We're also working with the Healthy Start Collaborative, which joins many of our partners. We have over 36 partners at the table in all different facets of the community. Um, that team is getting together. We actually opened up another meeting. Um, we generally are in kind of in that downslope at this point in the school year. Um, however, we decided as a collective it would be better for us all to meet and look at what those gaps are in service. So uh, part of what we're doing on May 4th is reconvening that group and being able to document what all is happening in the community, even outside of the school district. So that will also help us give a resource to parents of what other programs are going on during that time period um, and really be able to highlight the good stuff that's going on with the library, city of Watsonville, um, and other partners that have additional camps and things that are going on. So we'll be able to provide that resource to our families as well so that they have some additional options. Yeah, or, you know, even if we're not able to pay, obviously that's mm -hmm. no longer an option. Thank you mm -hmm. for that clarification. Mm -hmm. But I know the, YM the YMCA offers reductions um, mm -hmm. in their camps. And, and mm -hmm. through the city of Watsonville, we do mm -hmm. have the Friends of Watsonville Parks and Recreation mm -hmm. um, Services. Uh, and we have our scholarship program, mm -hmm. right, that mm -hmm. also allows family to pay half of the cost. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's uh, if we're not able to... Uh, necessarily financial support families, we can provide them with those resources and make them yes. easily accessible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I know just from sitting on the board of the Friends, we don't get as many scholarship requests mm -hmm. as I would think otherwise, because mm -hmm. the need is huge. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. 
and, and even having uh, you know the uh, application waiver f through the YMCA accessible mm -hmm. at our schools, um, I think will be huge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's just you know options to explore. Yeah, those are great ideas. The communication and alignment of that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, for mentioning that. I'd completely forgotten that we had offered that during COVID time. Yeah, yeah and, and then just for our high schoolers, you know, expanding, I'm not sure how popular uh, the program is, but the summer at the city program. I know that's uh, very, very, mm -hmm. very popular this year. Mm -hmm. 41, 41 applications for 25 slots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. even expanding those opportunities does mm -hmm. not necessarily, you know, credit recovery, mm -hmm. though that's obviously a, a, a huge part of um, a support that students need, but also expanding opportunities mm -hmm. for them to be able to earn um, a wage, you know, over the summer while also mm -hmm. gaining access to this awesome internship opportunities. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we have lots of partners, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that they will be willing to collaborate with us to further expand those opportunities mm -hmm. for students. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Carol. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Carol. That was mm -hmm. a great presentation. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank Can you I make a follow-up request? Trust do you just that? No. President Deserta. <laughs> <laughs> Eager to get to the next item. No, I know. Go ahead. <laughs> but no, can we just put this information actually in the wellness center also? Um, it's because we are having more families that are accessing yeah. that. Yeah. And uh -huh. maybe the cost of the program too, like mm -hmm. Maria was stating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Thanks, Carol. And now without further ado, um, we have Principal Peggy Pugh come up to the podium. And I want to thank everybody for their patience thank tonight. Thank you so much. I'm really honored to be here. Thank you, President DeSerpa, trustees, and Superintendent Rodriguez. We are honored to be here tonight uh, requesting the honor of uh, remembering and honoring our forever mariner, Bobby Salazar. And I did send some slides a couple days ago, well, on Friday. Do you want me to resend? Okay, it's the, yeah. Or I could resend it. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Is there anything you could do to set the stage before the slides come up, Certainly. or do you want to wait? No, I'm, it's I'm up happy. To you. To, I am happy to speak off the cuff. You know that uh, uh, I like Mike. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm. I uh, when um, Bobby passed away, there was a lot of community outreach and and thinking of ways that they could honor him, and we wanted to work with his family and with our local community to make sure that. It was something that was um, truly worthy of, of uh, commemorating him. And um, over the course of these couple of years, there's obviously been a lot of challenges through COVID. And so we, we just, we took our time really settling on something um, that our community felt like was, was, would really be worthy of um, his generous heart and generous spirit. Um, so he touched so many lives here in PBUSD, but also obviously um, at the Aptos High School community, and so that was really important to us, um, that it was um, worthy of him and his, his giant heart. Um, that was um, one of the, I think kind of the, the driving force for us was um, making sure that he was kind of at the center of that and the love that he shared with so many of us was at the center of that. I did send this out. Yeah, I told okay. you. Okay. <laughs> oh. Now it's, uh, you have to grant access. Okay. I can't grant access. <laughs> 
Sorry. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'll say just from my own perspective, I was a parent at Aptos High, and Bobby was always just a very, and everybody already knows this, so I'm not saying anything that isn't already out there, but he made everybody feel good. He greeted everyone every morning with big smile. When he came here to the board meetings, he was always a gentleman. He always made me feel like he cared about me and everybody else that came into his purview. And we really, really miss him because he's irreplaceable. Yeah. Thank you for being here. I'm sorry it took so long tonight. I remember I was sitting at a football game one night and um, the timer on the lights like expired and all the lights went dark and it was <laughs> I just remember there was loud loud like rock music playing which still continued to play but there was no lights on and um, and there were two teams on the field and people in the stands and it was Bobby of course that went and fixed the whole thing you know within like five minutes it was fixed <laughs> there we go okay so um Thank you. I'm honored to be here to represent, obviously, my school community, but really the community of Aptos. Um, and is this the clicker? Thank you. So we went through the board approved process. We held two meetings in March. Our, those meetings were publicized through all of our, our normal channels, through our website and through our local newspapers and our athletics website as well. At those committee meetings, the first meeting, we developed our criteria and we used those criteria uh, that were unanimously voted on to um, help us make our decision because it's an open process. So the committee's criteria were connections to Aptos High, whether it was a graduate, athlete, family members attending Aptos High, or what were the specific connections. Past contributions to Aptos High, whether it's in time, in spirit, donations, or just general gregariousness, and also mariner pride and spirit and spreading positivity about our school out in the broader community. And we use those criteria to guide us. After our discussion, we discussed what names of people would meet those criteria, and it was a unanimous decision um, that we would send forward to the board for your consideration the name Bobby Salazar Field for our lower field, our lower athletic field, which is the field just as you're coming into the campus. And um, I, I hope that it warms your heart as much as it warms ours when we look at these pictures and you can really just see the pride he had in our school community. So for the first criteria, his connections to Aptos High School, um, this is sort of a greatest hits of, of Bobby Salazar. He was our lead custodian for over 40 years. He was available to anyone who needed his help. Staff, students, campus visitors, seven days a week at any time of day. His children, Melissa and Robert, attended Aptos High. Melissa's here with me tonight as, as well as his wife, Rebecca. They lived at Aptos High School. He truly was a, a part of the campus community. In 2010, he was inducted into our Sports Hall of Fame as an honorary member. One of our Sports Hall of Fame members is here tonight, Mr. Jamie Townsend, former Mariner himself. He served as Aptos High, he served both Aptos High and PBUSD community as uh, a leader in CSEA, including as president of the chapter. In terms of his second criteria, his, con his contributions to Aptos High School, uh, I'll make this quick because I know it's a long meeting already, <laughs> but it's a long list. Assistant football coach, basketball coach, he spoke at so many of our events. He was the person that most people associated with Aptos High School well after they graduated. Um, his contributions were from club leader to um, name reader at graduation, singer at graduation, fiddle player in the school plays. <laughs> he was selected many, many times to hand roses to the seniors at graduation. Um, the list literally goes on and on. He changed every light bulb on campus, uh, unclogged every clogged toilet. <laughs> he did every single thing. Um, and I'm sure there were, there were uh, so many injuries involved with those things that we don't even want to list them. 
he was available. You could knock on his door at 5 in the morning as activities director. I did that. Sorry, Bobby. Sorry, Rebecca. Um, and late, late at night, as we'd be closing up our dances at late at night, he was available there to us as well. And for over 40 years, he treated every single student, staff member, parent, local community uh, guest with love and kindness, friendship, and he was incredibly warm. His third criteria, his mariner pride, it's, I, I can still feel it beaming. His uh, just general love of Aptos High School, he was truly a fixture in our community. He greeted, greeted students and staff by name, always letting them know what, when they arrived that Aptos High School was the best school in the county, which we strongly believe. He greeted students and staff and families with a wave, keep smiling, good morning everybody. I can still hear him saying that. I wore pink for him tonight. He, was a, he always wore pink. In 2015, the Aptos Chamber of Commerce selected him as their community hero. And that was a great asset for, to Aptos High and to PDUSD. The local community still to this day, if I'm wearing Mariner wear, which is most days, uh, many people when I'm out in the stores in Aptos ask how, you know, how are you remembering the mayor of Aptos? Bobby. So the field has yet to be named, and we are hoping to name it for Bobby Salazar. There he is in his beloved pink. And that is him judging at one of our many homecoming parades. So in conclusion, he believed truly in the power of community. And his community was Aptos High School. And we we're humbled to be able to request naming the field for him, Bobby Salazar Field. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Are there any speakers to this item tonight? Would you mind coming up to the podium to say that? Because you know the this is televised and live streamed, so it would be great if our, our viewing audience could hear what you have to say. We have Jamie Townsend. Is that Jamie? Yeah. yeah. This is hard to do. <laughs> I know, Jamie. Come up right to the mic. My name is Jamie Townsend, and yeah. this is Melissa, Bobby, Bobby's, Rebecca Salazar. I mean, Melissa. <laughs> Okay. Um, to me, Bobby arrived 10 years after I started teaching and coaching at Aptos High. And so that was the first time I was able to greet him. And then I got to witness everything that uh, we've all described Bobby and put together with your beautiful package. Um, I, the only thing that I want to add is that two words some people would say a person like Bobby, if they just saw him, oh, he's just a janitor. Forget that. He is a custodian. And if you start adding all the things that custodians can do, it, the list just goes and goes and goes. And Peggy Pugh just described a lot of the things that he has done as a custodian in our community. He truly is a mariner, and we love him. And this is one of the things we can do to put his name on the field closest to the street that goes by and comes into our school so all of us can remember how he greeted all of us and we get to see his name every day even though he's gone thank you, thank you. that was really beautiful thank you, Coach Who's next? And we have hi. melissa salazar yeah. melissa hi, hi. Thank you for coming. um so kind of connecting to the presentations earlier, my dad was always there for everybody, regardless who you were or what you did. And part of that, he would reach out to those kids they were talking about earlier who were at youth, the youth who were at risk. He would try to push them towards sports, and he would mentor them. So that fits with tonight's kind of tonight's theme. Also, I remember like yeah, I had to go to summer school. He was there, and he would mentor those kids, too. So he was always there reaching out to kids. So, I mean, he wasn't just my dad. He was everybody's dad in some capacity or form. He was there for one and all, and 
like to me he's always coach townsend said <laughs> you know what better way to honor him and his legacy than to name the field after him because he was there for the sports the community and you know it being like a softball field one of my favorite movies is the sandlot and there's a quote in there where babe ruth is telling one of the boys heroes get remembered but legends never die so how i look at it because people keep bringing up my dad all the time my dad bobby salazar was a legend at aptos high school and aptos and in the community because i even moved to southern california several years ago and i came back but even in Southern California, talking to people, oh, where are you from, Aptos? Do you know Bobby? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do. He's my dad. So the legend for him will continue on in naming the field after him. And I know if he were here, he'd be saying, hi, everybody, you know. But also he would be humble, being like, no, no, not for me. But yeah, for you. You know, you you work so hard to help the community. Why not have a place for students and people to get together like in the theme tonight, to feel safe and do things. So thank you. Thank you, Melissa. I just want to, I just want to say thank you. I'm, I'm speechless. <laughs> and it's hard because I miss him a lot. And I'm sure that everybody at the school does too. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Rebecca. OK, thank you. And with that, I'll entertain a motion. I'd like to move to approve it. I'd also like to make a comment. You're, you're moving to approve? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll second. All those in favor? Oh, I'd like to make a comment. Oh, a comment. Those. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. I didn't hear that part. No problem. I just wanted to say, you know, I remember the first time I saw Bobby. And it was, you know, August of 2012 when I do dropped my oldest off to Aptos High. And, you know, that, that smile and wave did so much to ease the nerves of this first time high school mama, you know. And that welcome and that, that true joy and connection was something that he carried in every interaction I had with him and throughout his time with all of us. And well before I entertained the thought of serving on this board, it's like I, I knew that he was a special part of our community and Although I'm gonna miss, like my youngest starts at Aptos High next year and, I, and I'm missing that he won't be waving. But getting to see his name on that field and getting to connect my youngest to who he was and who he was for our community is still incredibly powerful. And so, you know, it, thank you for sharing him with us. Are there any other comments from the board? Danny? I just want to say, uh, man, the first time I, I met Bobby's when he in, invited me to talk to CSCA members, and he loved his union, he lo he loved the members, and as soon as, as soon as I walked in, I said, "Hey, Dodge," and I, I, I didn't know him, and that was the first time I met him. But just, but just the way that, you know, how some of you were saying, like, even if he didn't know you. Like, he just gave that, I don't know you, but I know you. And I, I felt that. Um, you know, Bobby loved Aptos, and Aptos loved Bobby. And you know, you know, thank you, uh, Aptos community members. I, um, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? I think it's all been said. OK. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. The Bobby sells our field. <laughs> Thank you all for being here tonight. Next on the agenda is visitor non-agenda items. This is two minutes each. Um, this is item 7.1, a public comment. Are, are there any speakers? We have two speakers tonight. Okay. Um, the first speaker is Marilyn 
Garrett followed by Chris Webb. What is this blue attachment? Oh, it's a thing to turn up. Okay. I don't know what this is. Two hours to get two minutes in this microwave radiation. Not good. Uh, you asked the question, what is the most important thing in keeping kids out of harm's way? You asked that of the policemen who are here. Wireless devices emit microwave radiation, a known biological harm hazard. Every time a wireless device is used, you're exposed to microwave radiation. The World Health Organization labels this radiation as a class 2B possible carcinogen in the same category as lead, DDT, and chloroform. Cell and cordless phones and other wireless devices, cell towers and antennas and towers, smart meters, microwave ovens, and Wi-Fi routers all create electrosmog. Microwave radiation is harmful. Scientists link wireless radiation to health problems both short and long term, cancer, infertility, damage to DNA and fetuses, sleep problems, memory and cognitive impairment, heart problems, immune deficiencies, and many others. I'm submitting today, for the record, uh, an excerpt from the book, An Electronic Silent Spring by Katie Singer. It came out in 2014. And one chapter I want to excerpt from because it relates to how you've put cell towers and wireless devices on campus. Thank you, Marilyn. This is, um, may I have another minute, please? Yeah. You had over a half hour for the police presentation on harm to our community. This is harm. Thank you, Marilyn. I would ask you to invite Dr. Carl Merritt or other authorities on the harm of this technology to children. Thank you. I ask that you respect to the do time. A presentation like we saw here. I, I hear you, Marilyn. Don't you want children to be healthy Thank you. and not in a microwave oven environment? Thank you. So I'm going to submit this for the record. And thank you so much for your kindness on giving me extra time. Thank you, Marilyn. I really appreciate it. I worked 20 years in this district. I really appreciate your kindness. Is Chris still here? Hi, Chris. Come on up. Um, I want to express my gratitude. I'm not sure whether it belongs to the, the district or my site admin, but I noticed that in the, the teacher restroom I used that there was feminine hygiene products made freely available, and I'm assuming it's for, our, for, for girls at the school and for trans students, and I'm, I'm hoping that it's also available in the regular girls' restrooms, but I, I really appreciate that we're getting ahead of state law on that. And I hope we keep it up also, like particularly with respect to ECE teacher wages, that they're well above uh, minimum wage. I also, um, I'm, I'm a little disappointed because I've recently found that our, at Renaissance, again, we're not gonna have in-person um, summer school, which we historically have had. And it, it kind of makes me think that we're, we're just not learning from our students' experiences, particularly the Renaissance students, and, and we didn't really learn from distance learning. Like, ingenuity, that's, that doesn't bring a lot of fun and cheer to my students. Um, so I just want to say that. I also want to thank Trustee DeSerpa and, and Dr. Rodriguez for the presentation with um, the police officers. I want to thank the police officers for their service. But I, I really appreciated that because it, it was a breath of fresh air because I feel like this year at Renaissance, we've been living in like an upside down world where we pretend gangs aren't a thing and we, we say like restorative justice. So it was, it was, it was nice to hear that, yeah, we're, it was a touch of reality. And um, I'm, I'm I just wish that we 
we it didn't take major incidences and like documented data of declining abs or uh, declining student achievement and increased absences to realize that yeah we do sometimes need progressive discipline and we do need sometimes consequences and for those reasons it was truly a mistake when we took away our old restorative program to do um, restorative start um, in a way that was less restorative than what we had. So I think we really need to get with our leadership team and find out what worked and let's bring that back. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That was a long beep. Okay, next up we have employee organizations comments. We will start with PBFT. This is item 8.1. Hi, Nellie. Hi, good evening. That doesn't want me. All right, good evening, board. Um, let's see. Uh, there are, I'm going to keep mine short tonight, um, hopefully. I, can, I know I can get long winded. <laughs> um, but I wanted to um, address the many things that are on our agenda tonight that you're going to be speaking about the resolutions appreciating teachers school nurses and our classified staff um, and i also wanted to note that tomorrow is april 28th is workers memorial day it's a day that honors the memory of workers who have been injured or died during their jobs um, we know that in the last couple of years uh, with under this pandemic, the stress of working through this pandemic has had an, un, uh, a, an impact on mental health of many workers, especially all our, our healthcare workers. And so we want to just acknowledge that tomorrow is um, Workers Memorial Day. Um, May 3rd, uh, you have the, listed as the appreciate National Teacher Appreciation Day. Um, our teachers are hard at work this year, have lost many, many um, hours of prep time. That's time that they can use to communicate with families, students, um, and grade papers and write lessons. Um, and due to the impacts of, of what we're working under, a teacher shortage and our pandemic, which creates va um, vacancies or absences, um, many of our teachers, classroom teachers, have lost their, their prep and because they're stepping in to be with our students. Um, so it would be really great if they had like maybe Wednesday, May 4th, uh, during our restructure day as a day to be able to close their doors in their classroom and get business done, you know, and, and as we get close to the end of the school year. Um, and I do want to, uh, thank our classified staff for all of the work they do. That's actually how I started out in this profession, um, in public education or K-12 world. Um, I was my path was to be a professor. So um, I do want to invite um, also in, uh, I, I just met some Watsonville High students and I wanted to invite them to be able to speak. It's um, tough when they, when our students come and they don't know the process of our meetings and they have something important to say and so I would like to um, give my time to them. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Good evening, members of the board and superintendent, Dr. Rodriguez. I'm Brooklyn Yamas and a junior at Watsonville High School. We are Watsonville High School Student Union. The majority of us notice the flaws within Watsonville, our school, community, and home. We grouped up and combined forces, collaborating with one another. Ultimately, we want and long for change, but most importantly, we desire for our voices to be heard. We have been failed countless times as we, the students, don't see action. Therefore, we've arranged a cleanup program which takes place every Wednesday after school. The beautification of our campus is a small step in the right direction. We are greatness from small beginnings. Although we might be slight in numbers, we aim to grow and create change, both community and school-wide. As we are stressing now, the bathrooms have not been a problem in the, pa in the present, but also in the past. We acknowledge that our school is aged and has seen its fair share as the years. Our school increases in population, and we must accommodate to this. Our bathrooms are simply outdated. Another issue we have present in our restrooms is vandalism. In schools that include young people, it is inevitable for this will occur, whether it is drawings of inappropriate figures on the wall or just floodings due to aged facilities. 
We, as a district, must accommodate to these occurrences. Anti-graffiti barriers can be applied to both restroom walls and stalls, instead of the marks being painted over. This, along with daily checks, can help ensure our restrooms are properly maintained. We hope you see the severity of this issue, as it not only is detrimental to the student morale, but also a health hazard. Hi, uh, thank you for listening once again. So going back to that Wednesday cleanup program we mentioned uh, beforehand, so it's actually, we took us about four weeks to get that approved, and not only is it a great way for students to get involved on campus, but we also actually offer community service hours, which is great. However, it's kind of upsetting that this ultimately has to be up to the students, again, which is not very ideal. However, it does show that we're trying to take action here and speaking on the bathrooms and the vandalism, I kind of think it has to do a lot with attitude. So going back to those bathrooms and how old they are, I like to compare it to, I think just this year, we got gender neutral bathrooms in our cafeteria. And when I go in there, I was, I was surprised to see how nice and upkept they were even after this, like we're already into our second semester and they still look nice. So it's ki it shows how students want to take care of something. I think when given something new that is clean and dated, it's modern, I think students would actually take care of them. Thank However, you for the comments. I think the time's up now. We appreciate you guys, what you're doing and coming forward. In the future, if you guys want to speak on any issue like this, put a speaker card in and you can come up to the mic. Each one of you can have two minutes. Okay, thank you very much for taking care of your campus and bringing these concerns forward to the board. I know Dr. Rodriguez appreciated hearing. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your time and thank you for I have a question though. So, I'm, I'm I don't, sorry. Th I'm sorry, but. No. My dear, you cannot speak like this in a public okay. meeting. I'm okay. sorry. Okay. Yeah. In the future, if you have a question, you can just email Dr. Rodriguez or call on the phone, and okay. she's really good about responding. I okay. This no, this is a public meeting. This is a board meeting held in public. So it's a meeting of this board held in the public. Okay. Um, next up, we have item 8.2. California School Employees Association. Tonight from CSEA. No, okay. Um, item 8.3, PAVAM. Is there anyone here from the Pajaro Valley Association of Managers? Yes. That's great, thank you. Okay, good evening, President DeSerpa. Good evening, board members. Good evening, Dr. Rodriguez. Does it go up? Yeah. That's okay. I'll do this. I'm good. All right. So thank you uh, for letting me speak on uh, behalf of the Pajaro Valley uh, administrators and managers. Uh, I'll try to go quick. I'm going to quickly highlight a few of the things we've been doing this year. I think you guys are pretty well aware of what's going on in the schools. Um, but, you know, PBSD cares. We are connecting and enriching the lives of our students uh, from Family Arts Night up at Landmark to um, Days of Kindness at Radcliffe to some of the things at um, Calabasas, whether it be our active green team with I think about 25 members going kayaking out at Elkhorn Slough to a family reading night, which was so well attended. We intended to have families work with the students, but we had so many show up, we had to send all the students outside to play just to accommodate all the parents. So it was quite a good highlight. Um, not to mention student jobs and other things throughout the schools to give them ownership and a feeling of belonging to the school sites. Uh, beyond connecting and enriching, as site admin, we are 
um, accelerating student learning by accelerating our leadership skills, uh, whether that's uh, collaborating in professional developments together, uh, working with outside consultants who are modeling lessons for us and um, doing other things, or even with some of our site administrators, like the middle picture with Mr. Perez at Calabasas, uh, modeling uh, learning strategies and uh, other expertise for teachers, uh, site admin is getting out there and accelerating uh, not just student learning, but our own learning so that we can improve our students' academics. Um, not only are we improving our student academics, but we're taking a big step in improving their social emotional learning as well. Uh, it's been difficult coming back from the pandemic. Um, so we put a lot of effort through programs such as Sanford Harmony, Playworks. Uh, we are facilitating student ownership, uh, giving the students a feeling of belonging, a feeling of ownership at school sites, uh, whether it's Playworks trainings and games, uh, to Sanford Harmony community building meetings, um, you know, restorative start, lots of those things. Um, so, yes, Pavam, we do truly care, but uh, we've also been doing, I wanted to also talk a little bit about what makes our team special. Um, so, I kind of jumped on the CARES acronym thing, figured, feel like we're all doing double the work, so we'll double up on the CARES acronym. Um, so, what makes our team special? Uh, we are extremely collaborative as administrators. Um, even a good example is, uh, you know, during a, a professional development with our awesome SELPA staff, they had breakout rooms for site admin to meet together, but uh, a lot of our site admin were out covering classes, so we were alone. So I went ahead and jumped into Mr. Moran's breakout room from Amesti, and sure enough, I found other site admin jumping into their rooms as well just to collaborate together. So they look for any opportunity to collaborate and build on each other's strengths. Accessible, um, we're totally accessible to each other as well as responsive. I know that when I'm out doing lunch duty, covering classes, doing whatever, uh, when I come and check my missed calls on my telephone, the first thing I do um, is usually call back principals and other site admin that call. And others do the same for me. So people are very responsive. Accessible, um, encouraging, uh, extremely encouraging, um, and solution-oriented is a big one. We don't uh, spend a lot of time on the problems. We spend a lot of time on the solutions. Uh, and generally what makes our team strong is everybody has a genuine, genuine um, loving, caring relationship, and we all love working together, and uh, that comes out through the work at the sites. So I think that was about it. So thank you. That was a great positive presentation. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. I appreciate you doing that. Yeah. Uh, is there anyone here tonight? Uh, item 8.4 for Communication Workers of America. I think this is the 12th year in a row that nobody has shown up for item 8.4. <laughs> OK. Um, we're going to move now to action items, and the first action item is to adopt Resolution 21-2240, acknowledging May 3rd, 2022 as National Teacher Appreciation Day. Yes. Thank you, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. I have the distinct pleasure of uh, presenting the Resolution for Teacher Appreciation Day, which is, as noted, May 3rd. Um, we have over 1,300 certificated staff that have been working tirelessly this year. Um, they work hard every year, but I think we've heard and seen that they are going above and beyond to care for our students. Um, and I think this year more than ever, we want to honor them and honor their work because they are providing um, instruction to our, to our students and doing a fabulous job. So I please move that you approve this resolution to honor our, our hardworking certificated staff. Do we have any speakers to this resolution? We have one. Okay. Uh, Chris Webb. Um, I want to congratulate Dr. Rodriguez on her nomination for Superintendent of the Year and note that one thing I think of with her is um, something one of my veteran teachers said and that that was that you're the best superintendent we've ever had. And in my experience across multiple districts, I'm inclined to agree. 
And I hope that um, to appreciate teachers, we make sure that um, in the coming year, we improve the contract to make sure we're supporting them as professionals, as in offering PDs that um, teachers are elected to do, and, and that those costs are covered. Sometimes certain sites will cover PD and other sites won't. Um, I also want to say that, that let's make sure that we're, we're listening to our teachers before um, issues arise and before the data bears out things they said months ago. Um, a lot of this is a lot of my feelings on this are coming from the way restorative practice has, has come to, to Renaissance and, and that the principles haven't always been held. So I, I feel like we out of respect to the teachers because when teachers do restorative practice with fidelity, they make themselves vulnerable. And when we don't um, support that system truly, they wind up getting harmed instead of healed. So I want to make sure that to admin and across the district we clarify restorative practice principles and that we make sure that we're serious about them. Or let's just not do it if we're not going to be serious. Um, and, and kind of with that, I, I just want to want to say that I, I don't know that I can, now that we're in the fourth quarter of the school year and it's crunch time for my students, I, I can't really devote any more time to site wellness uh, because it hasn't been really effective. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step back from that and focus on what I can do to support students myself. But I think if we want to appreciate teachers in the short run um, and make up for some of the harm, let's add a, a retention bonus to this, uh, to this resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. OK, do we have any discussion from the board or comments? I'd like to make a motion to approve this item. I'll second. And before I call for the vote, I'll just um, say a great big thank you to all of our teachers. We love you, and we're glad you're here, and we appreciate you working with all our kids and keeping them safe. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Next item is 9.2, adopt a resolution 21-22-41, acknowledging May 15th through 21st, 2022, as classified school employee week. Yes, thank you again, President De Serpa, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. I also have the distinct pleasure of presenting the resolution for uh, the classified employee, school employee um, in the district we have, uh, which is May 15th through the, the 21st, um, as, we have uh, nearly a thousand classified employees that have also been working tirelessly getting our students to school. They're often the first person they see and the last person, first and last people they see when they're leaving campus. Um, and they play an integral role in ensuring that our, we're providing a quality and solid educational um, program. So I request that you approve this resolution. Thank you, are there any speakers? No. Okay, any discussion from the board? Yes. Okay. Um, I just wanted to make a comment um, thanking all of our classified workers for all their work, hard work in our community and our district. And with that, I'd like to make a motion to approve this agenda item. Thank you, Allison, for presenting. I'll second. Thank you. And again, to all the classified staff, we can't, we can't do it without you. You're integral to, to what we provide here. So thank you for all the hard work. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Item 9.3, adopt a resolution 21-22-42 for National School Nurse Day. Good evening, my name's Heather Gorman, um, SELPA director. Good evening, President DeSerpa, board members, Dr. Rodriguez. Tonight I bring forward a resolution to celebrate and honor our school nurses. National Nurse Week begins each year on May 6th and ends on May 12th. Florence Nightingale's birthday. Florence Nightingale is known for many amazing reasons, but may be the most known for making hospitals a cleaner and safer place to be. For inspiration tonight, I'd like to read just a few of her quotes, and I will make this quick. <laughs> tough times don't last, tough people do. Ignite the mind's spark to raise the sun in you. I attribute my success to this. I never gave or took an excuse. Let us never consider ourselves finished nurses. We must be learning all of our lives. 
I thought that encompassed our school nurses. And from the resolution, whereas children are the future, by investing in them today, we are ensuring our world for tomorrow. And all students have the right to have their health needs safely met while in school. School nurses are professional nurses that advance the well-being, academic success, and lifelong achievements of all of our students by serving on the front lines and providing a critical safety net for our nation's most fragile children. Therefore, be it resolved that the PVUSD Board of Education celebrates, acknowledges the accomplishments of the school nurses everywhere and their efforts of meeting the needs of today's students by improving the delivery of health care in our schools and offers gratitude to the school nurses who contribute to the community by helping students stay healthy in schools and ready to learn and keeping parents, guardians at work not just on this National School Nurse Day, but at every opportunity throughout the year. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Um, do we have any speakers to this item? No speakers. Okay, any comments from the board? Jennifer I Holm. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to move to approve, please. <laughs> but I also just want to acknowledge the work that our school nurses you know, do. I, 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 what, what's been coming to mind is that that you know saying about you know that Ginger Rogers did everything Fred Astaire did just backwards and in heels, and in a lot of ways like <laughs> school nursing is like that, you know it's just there's all these different things to deal with and and, it, and the school nurses just have such a unique and important role, and so there we go. I'll second. Okay, a first and a second. Thank you to our school nurses. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, the motion passes unanimously, 7-0. Thank you. Next item up is item 9.5. No, it is not. It is item 9.4, adopt resolution 21-22-43, recognizing Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Hi. Good evening, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Minorities and other vulnerable groups have been targeted for persecution during public health crises throughout history. In 14th century Europe, it was the Jews for the bubonic plague, 1900s the Chinese for a plague outbreak in San Francisco, in the 1980s the Haitians were wrongly blamed for bringing HIV AIDS to the United States, and now over the past two years, the hate incidents against Asian Americans have skyrocketed due to the rhetoric of COVID-19. Over the last two years, violent attacks against Asian American Pacific Islanders are 11 times higher than in the past. We bring resolutions forward to recognize and celebrate different groups within our organization and our society. For the resolution before you, we are asking that not only do we recognize and celebrate the contributions, achievements, and history of Asian American Pacific Islanders, like the first Asian American Vice President, but also take time to reflect on our own actions on how we contribute to or help stop the persecution of others who are not like us. Through the month of May, in the news section, we have resources for teachers and the public as well um, to links to local Asian American Pacific Islander organizations and information on upcoming local events and then resources for teachers. Resolution 212243 recognizes May as Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. I'm gonna read a, just a few excerpts from the resolution. Whereas Asian American Pacific Islanders comprise many ethnicities and languages, and their multitude of achievements embody the American experience. And whereas immigrant, refugee, and American-born community members of Asian and Pacific Islander ancestry have contributed immensely to the growth and stability of the state of California, the Pajaro Valley Unified School District, and community by deepening our American values of family, education, social justice, and community, which further shapes the social and economic character of this county. And now, therefore, be it resolved that the Pajaro Valley Unified School District proclaim May 2022 as Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month to inspire equity and celebrate diversity within our community, to elevate the voices and honor the stories of our local Asian American Pacific Islander history, to partner with local agencies such as the Tabera Project, to educate teachers, staff, and students of the conscious and unconscious biases prevalent in our society today. And thank you, and with that, staff ask for the approval of the re resolution. Thank you, Lisa. Do we have any speakers to this topic? No. Okay, do we have any comments or questions? Yes. Danny? Uh-huh, sorry, Jen. Well, I, 
I just wanted to say, you know, thank you for bringing this resolution up. Uh, the Japanese, Filipino, and Chinese residents of Watsonville were the first farm workers in the Pajaro Valley. During World War II, when the United States government sent away the Japanese Americans, they still volunteered to fight for the United States. In my district alone, you know, we, we have a Buddhist temple on Bridge Street where they celebrate the Oban Festival um, in August. And what the Oban Festival is, is where Japanese American citizens celebrate their ancestors. I'll bring some more information. It's, I, I'd recommend it. Um, you know, there's a small Japanese American family that own a, a restaurant on, off of East Lake. Um, there's a small Filipino grocery store Mm -hmm. I believe on East Lake by Cardenas. And they're also on Blackburn Street with the Japanese American Citizens League, where they focus on not just you know, human rights for everybody. So I just like to show that there are strong presence in Watsonville. And thank you for bringing this up. Trustee Shocker. I just wanted to say thank you for bringing this forward again. We brought forward a resolution similar um, last year when our community um, was going through the pandemic and many Asians were being blamed, like you said, mm -hmm. for the coronavirus. Um, I just want to acknowledge the work that Watsonville and the Heart does. Um, they just launched their digital archives, archives recently, and it's important to remember everybody's heritage here in Watsonville and the Asian Filipino community plays a big part in our heritage of Watsonville. So thank you and I'll second the motion. You have a second? Mm -hmm. Okay. Trustee Roscoe, do you have a comment? No, I think okay. the resolution says it all. We have a first and a second. Thank you for bringing it forward. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 7-0. Thank, thank you. you. Now is item, item 9.5, approve resolution 21-2239 for Rural School Bus Pilot Program. Hi. Hi. Good evening, President Deserpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, several years ago, on behalf of PBUSD, I applied for a grant with the Rural School Bus um, Pilot Program. In the third year of selection, we have been selected and awarded a grant for a replacement bus. Um, the award is for one electric bus funded up to $400,000 with a small amount of money for um, infrastructure charging, charging infrastructure. Um, one of the requirements prior to completing the application process is that we have a board resolution showing approval um, of the submission of the application for this grant process. So staff respectfully request your approval of this resolution. Are there any speakers to this item? None. Great. Any comments from our board? Um, I'd like to say thank you for taking the opportunity to apply for this grant. This is fantastic, and we appreciate um, the motivation that you had in going after that money. It's very special. So, do Make we have a, a motion? Motion to approve. Motion Second. to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we already covered item 9.6, so we'll move to item 9.7, a Williams quarterly report for January, February, and March of 2022. Yes, thank you, President, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. So I have the quarter three Williams report. Um, as you know, the district needs to adopt um, a complaint procedure, and so we have done so and are following it. So for quarter three, we did have one um, facilities complaint that we received. Um, for Lakeview Middle School and the complaint has been addressed and resolved and responded to and so um, that is what our quarter three report is showing. Uh, is there any, are there any speakers? No. Okay, any questions from the board? Oh. Tristia Acosta? Yeah, I just have a question. Mm -hmm. um, with the, um, so you said we received the one complaint from mm -hmm. Lakeview Middle School? Yes and um in the third quarter mm -hmm. and 
I, I mean, at numerous meetings, we keep getting complaints, particularly from Watson High, about the bathrooms. We heard it again tonight, and I know we're not going to engage in that dialogue here, but I'm just wondering if we're getting those complaints here at the board meeting, how come the, are, do, the, do, 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 do our teachers, administration, our staff, our students, do they not know how to file a complaint to have it raised to this level of awareness? I'm, why are we hearing it at the board level but not seeing it? Here is my guess, my question. So this complaint procedure is predominantly for like the community members and or they can be filed at the school site, but it is also for, this one was actually filed by someone who is not even a part of the school district necessarily. They can be filed by anybody right. regarding conditions to be brought to the attention of, of the board. Um, so it's an avenue similar to like when we have complaints filed against either employees or the district, you can follow that procedure, but still, if things are brought up to district administration that are not necessarily following the f formal process, does not mean that we don't follow up and respond to them. So there's just a formal process that are that are that is out there and is public that people can engage in that might not be a part of the school community, but it's just a venue for them to be able to file a complaint. But it doesn't mean that all of the ones like you've said that we've either he heard or that engage in any one of us that we're not addressing them just because they maybe didn't file a formal Williams complaint. Great. I, I, and I appreciate that explanation, and I, I get that. And uh -huh. I'm not saying that I want it to have to go to the formal, sure. you know, but I'm just wanting to make, because it just, it, it just seems to be a continuum. We continually, continually, continually seem to be having these complaints brought to the boardroom, and that's fine. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, people have their, their right to approach this board mm -hmm. with that, mm -hmm. but I just, you know, wanting to sure that something's happening in the process because again mm -hmm. when they come and speak to the board we can't actively engage in a dialogue about it so you know what is happening to get it resolved and I, like I said I'm not saying that it necessarily needs to be escalated to this level but right just wanting to you know because it can't be a back and forth right well and I believe that the board has the opportunity to either agenda eyes things or follow up with the superintendent when, when concerns are brought for follow-up so that you are informed of how if there are being resolutions to issues that are brought up to the podium is that my correct? And yeah, and, and maybe that might be maybe something in the B2B or something that we could have. So every week um, we have um, weekly communication with the board and we always do full board follow-up after, after the time. I would say the reason why the most of the time it doesn't reach this is because we are able to have resolution to it. And so once we have resolution, um, then we bring it forward. Um, but, you know, I will say that we've had more Williams complaints um, this year, but most of them um, were either linked to the TikTok challenges or they were linked to um, staff shortages, um, both of which are fairly out of our control. Um, the bathrooms, which they were referring to the vandalism, is once again um, social media. I'm supporting the vandalism of them. Um, I did specifically go into, just I'll say this briefly and then stop, did specifically go into the bathroom, one of the bathrooms that was shut down at Watsonville High when I was doing my day in the life um, because of the massive destruction in that room. It, we couldn't have it open. Um, there literally were no longer ceiling tiles and there were holes. Um, and so we're not talking about just um, graffiti, but um, we're talking about mass major damage, major damage that repair. really the room is no longer safe to be in. Um, and I would just say COVID um, delays are still not over at this point. Um, and so sometimes repairing things, whether it's HVAC like this, because we just can't get the, the part, it's not always as easy as um, uh, HVAC goes down and now we can repair it. Um, we, we do go as far, and in this case we did, we went as far as ask staff to drive to Sacramento to pick up the part to make it as quick as possible. Um, and so I do feel like um, we're doing our due diligence on that. Um, and staff is working really hard. MNO staff is working really hard. Um, but we, we, do need, um, we do need students to um, not vandalize to the point where um, it's not repairable in a quick period of time. Thank you for the clarification elaboration. And again, I wasn't saying I was encouraging that it has I, to escalate I, to this level. I'm just wondering mm -hmm. that the gap with the, con it seems continual, continual, continual complaint. Thank you. 
Danny. Just to, to briefly follow up, you were saying, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez, it, it's not just the Watts of Ohio, it's also it's a lot of schools, uh, um, EA Hall too. You know, just the, the, the mass destruction, you know, stealing toilet parts and stealing the dispensers, it's, it's everywhere, so, yeah. Okay, so we need to vote to accept this Williams report. Okay. I'll make a Three. motion to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay, 9.8, adopt a declaration of need for fully qualified educators. Mm -hmm. Good evening, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, my name is Brian Saxon. I'm the Director of HR for Certificated. And this is a declaration of need for fully qualified educators. So. Um, PVUSD has an annual shortage of appropriately credentialed teachers in the following areas. Bilingual education, special education, math and science, and when shortages in the area of special education occur, or math and science, or bilingual, or social studies, uh, the, department of, the departments employ a ver variety of means to help reduce that shortage. A teacher internship programs, waivers, and emergency, emergency credentialing. Uh, without a board adopted declaration, the district will not be able to employ a sufficient number of teachers to fulfill its obligation to the students and community. So it is my recommendation that you approve our um, declaration of need so we can have teachers who uh, get STIPs and PIPs and other emergency types of permits. Thank you for that report. Mr. Saxon, do we have any speakers? No. No. Do we have any comments or questions from the board? Uh, Jen Shocker. Do we know approximately how many teachers we are short for this upcoming year? We're, we're as of last count, we have um, about 65 openings that we're currently working on filling, um, with most of them coming from secondary uh, because of um, reduction in staff at elementary. So we're way ahead of the game. I know 65 sounds like a huge number, but just today we hired five secondary people, uh, two science, two Spanish, and an ELD teacher. Uh, Pajaro High, as of last week, was completely staffed for next year, and then two people resigned. But at one point, it was fully staffed. <laughs> um, so we're way ahead of the game, so we anticipate that we will have not as many or none of what we started with this year. So. Okay. Yeah, we're hiring people on a daily basis. Okay. And just so the public knows, can you tell us about some of the um, things that we're doing to incentivize teachers to come to PBSD? Yeah, we've implemented a number of MOUs with PBFT for signing bonuses for our hard-to-fill positions like math and science. For our, our two high schools who were hit pretty hard, Watsonville High and PV High. Uh, those are both $2,500. If you are working in a B-clad program, it's another $2,500. So if a teacher was a B-clad math or science and worked at PV High or Watsonville, they could get up to a $7,500 bonus. Um, for a teacher just in any particular opening, for a general classroom teacher, um, it's $2,500 bonus, and then it kind of escalates from there depending on where you're headed. Uh, for our nurses, we have a $2,500 bonus as well because we're working on, um, you know, enticing them to come to our district as well. And all of our applications have that as well as our bilingual stipend, and we're really pushing that our salary uh, is now one of the top in the county, plus you pay so little for benefits. Um, so just a success story. We literally had someone come in, uh, it was either this Monday or last Monday, who wanted to teach art. Um, we called up Watsonville High, they went over there, interviewed, and we hired her on the spot because of what's happening. So the staff is very aware of what we're doing, and um, I feel like we're, yeah, we're ahead of the game from where we were last year. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions? I'd like to commend um, 
our HR department, Brian, and all the work that you're doing to, to sort of uncover every rock to find the best and the brightest to bring them here to our district on behalf of the kids. So thank you for all the work. Sure. It's, yeah. um, we're, uh, we got a report tonight of all the different things you guys are doing and trying and I, we really appreciate we're trying, you. We're trying a lot. So yeah, uh, thank my, you. My team is really like following up on every lead. So they're doing a lot of the, the, the down on boots on the ground work, I guess. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. Um, okay, so I, I need a motion. a motion. I'll move, okay, oh. I'll second. Okay, first and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries unanimously, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Item 9.9, .9, approve a mem memorandum of understanding with PVFT for math, science, special ed, and BCLAD signing bonus for the 2022-2023 school year. Yes, thank you, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. So we have a signing bonus um, for you tonight for math, science, special ed, and BCLAD. Um, this language is sunsetting in the master contract with PVFT. Um, and as you know, as Brian just talked about, we have the MOU with them through July 15th for the compounding signing bonus. And so we need to continue being able to allow that for that compound as well as we intend to provide signing bonuses for the next school year while we're in negotiations with, um, with PBFT. Um, I think an addition which is not in the master contract is the BCLAD, and I think as we've shown, it's the, as it's part of our declaration of need, we added that as a hard to fill position alongside math, science, um, and special ed and also trying to show the commitment that we have to our dual language programs and how important it is to have bilingual educators in our district so um, the language is all the same in the way we've applied it the, in the previous board meetings I presented in terms of it being paid over two years and needing to maintain their positions um, and so that MOU is is the same so I um, request that you present this MOU tonight or present I presented it you approve it thank you <laughs> Sorry. do we have any speakers we don't have speakers to this item. Okay. Any questions from the board? Discussion? I'd like to make a motion to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you, Allison. Are you, are you up next? <laughs> yes, it's still me. Last one. It is still you. It's okay. Nine, All right. 9.10 approved memorandum of understanding yes. with PVFT for the 2022 2023 school year for full day kindergarten and transitional kindergarten pilot and yes. this is a long time coming <laughs> okay <laughs> well it didn't take long to get here the uh so anyway thank you uh, president of the board of trustees dr rodriguez we have two mous for you tonight um for a full day kinder pilot at uh the six schools right there minty white valencia and soto ohlone alianza and freedom um so we worked uh collaboratively with pvft to outline um some of the working conditions that they would have in terms of release minutes, as well as classroom supports, um, and then additional days in order to get ready to, to fully implement a full day, day kinder. So, um, you know, we're excited for the collaboration and we're excited to be able to offer um, full day kinder program at those participating sites. Um, in addition, um, we are looking to also offer a full day TK at the two sites that are also having full day kinder. So that would be Minty White and Valencia. And again, you'll see the MOUs are very similar in terms of release minutes. Um, the only little difference with TK is that the statute has them at a 12 to one ratio of adult to student for the following for next school year. And then it'll move to a 10 to one. Um, so that's the only kind of a little bit difference between the two um, MOUs. But um, again, we worked, we worked collaboratively with PBFT. We got these done rather quickly, so we're excited to be able to put them in front of you um, for approval. And um, Casey Clappenbeck has already been working with the teachers and planning for next year, so we're ready to, we're ready to go. That's awesome. Do we have any speakers to this? We do not. Any comments from the board? Just have a quick question. Okay. Um, how, were, how were Menti, White, and Valencia selected as the schools to pilot? Um, the TK program? They were selected because of the fact that they're going to have full day kinder. So we weren't trying to add mm. multiple sites with full day kinder. Some are doing full day TK. So the only sites that are selected are the ones that are already offering full day kinder. Got it. Um, okay. And then just one little piece I kind of left out. We, they will not be going full day until about after Thanksgiving. So we're going to gradually ease them into a full day. That's a little also different from what we're doing with Kinder. Kinder will start the first day, but TK will be a gradual, gradual increase. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, any other questions or discussion? I'd like to make a motion. I'll second. Uh, first and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That's great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Oops, where are my glasses? Okay. Item nine. I'd like to make a motion to extend our meeting. Uh, okay. Till what time? To 1 a.m. I'll second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Aye. Okay. Motion carries. Seven zero. Six zero. Sorry, six. <laughs> I gotta look at my list. Six one. Six one. Thank you. Okay. Next up is um, Ms. Pamela Shanks with item nine point one one personnel commission board appointed vacancy. Great, thank you so much, um, President DeSerpa, Superintendent Rodriguez, and board members. Um, the Personnel Commission merit rules require that the Board of Education publicly announce the name of the person that it intends to, appo in intends to appoint to fill the unexpired term. Uh, Ms. McFadden's last month with the commission will be June of this year. Um, so it's the recommendation of staff to publicly announce Mr. Casey O'Brien as the board's candidate to fill the unexpired term set to expire on December 1st, 2023. Uh, Mr. O'Brien is a lifelong educator working as a special education teacher and school administrator. Um, he's worked both inside of PVUSD and also for surrounding school districts, which gives him a unique perspective of the broad scope of operations of a district. Um, he has a deep respect for classified employees and the integral work they perform in supporting students and staff in the district. Mr. O'Brien promotes strong, positive relationships between employees, administration, and employee organizations. Um, he looks forward to the opportunity to serve his community and ensure the continued success of the merit system in our district. Um, I believe he will make a great addition to the Personnel Commission. Um, at a future meeting, um, at the June 8th meeting, actually, there will be a public hearing, um, at which point the public will be given the opportunity to express their views on the qualifications of the candidate um, brought forward. Um, I would like to ask Casey if he'd like to come forward and say a few words, but um, briefly, um, and then I would just ask the board to publicly announce Mr. Casey O'Brien as their appointee for the Personnel Commission. Thank you. Good evening, trustees and Superintendent Rodriguez and cabinet members. Thanks for the opportunity to come up and introduce myself to um, those that I don't know and a few of you that I do know and have worked with in the past. It's nice to be here. Um, and I was so happy to see that this was so far down the agenda. I'm very excited about that. Um, and I'm only partially kidding because it was really nice to listen to all the great things that are happening in the district um, and a nice co coincidence to have Bobby Salazar and a field name for him tonight because I loved him dearly and um, for about eight years of my life probably spent more time with him than anybody in my family. So um, what a lovely evening and, and a nice thing that you all did for that. Um, and uh, Pam introduced me a bit and said a few of the things that I was going to say, but um, working for the district for over 20 years, I really um, appreciated uh, my experience and my opportunities. And I feel like I, with my teams, did a lot of great work for kids. And I'm very proud of that. Um, coming here as a teacher, then as an assistant principal at EA Hall, principal at Lakeview, and then uh, finally principal at Aptos High, I was um, really enjoyed my time and feel like I got a broad experience and really valued our classified employees, which is part of the reason or the main reason I'm here is kind of talk about that personnel commission and why I think I would be a good fit for that. Um, and I always have felt and still feel like our classified employees are really the backbone of our district. Um, Bobby, again, being a great example of that, not only as a classified employee, but um, an, an employee in general. Um, our, our classified staff are really do uh, the heavy lifting and are super important. So. Um, respecting the merit system and making sure that that's fair and supporting any potential conflicts or um, issues that need to be resolved um, is an important thing to do. And um, I feel like I can make a contribution and give a unique perspective as an educator because the other two commissioners are not from this field. So um, I would enjoy doing that and think I'm a good fit. And yeah, I think that's all I'll say. <laughs> I don't know if there's any questions or anything. Uh, do we have any speakers to this item? No speakers. Okay. Any questions or discussion from the board? Danny? I think you might have been at EA Hall when I was there. 
Yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Look at where you're, where you're at now. <laughs> uh, how many people applied for this position? Um, we did have um, a few people that turned in letters of interest, um, and out upon reviewing them, we um, determined that Casey, Ms. O'Brien, was the um, one that brought the broadest experience um, to the position. Thank you. Other comments from the board? Thank Having, you for staying. <laughs> yeah, thank you for staying. Thank you for um, being willing to serve in this capacity. I worked with you a long time, and I know and trust your judgment, and I want to thank you um, for your service to this district and still serving kids and wanting to help us with the Personnel Commission. We really appreciate you and all the years you gave. So thanks for coming back. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Pam. Great to see a lot of friendly faces. And yeah. Years. Um, do we, this is a action item, I'll, so I'd I'll like to make a motion to approve this. I'll so. second. Okay, for a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Pam. You. Congratulations. Item 9.12, Core SIPs Agreement, S22-007. Good evening again, um, President DeSerpa. Is, is this right? <laughs> Sorry, I was just looking. That, is that? Oh, I thought, I thought you were only going to do the special education one. Are you doing the elementary one as well? Oh. I am just doing the special education okay, one. Did so I get messed up? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Heather. Okay. I think this presentation is by Casey, Casey Clappenbeck. The SIPs agreement from CORE. Well, I, no? This is, they just have the wrong, oh. the wrong one. He's pulling up my consent item instead. Uh, yeah. it's, not, it's not consent, it's action. Yeah. And it is the elementary version. I can speak to if we need to, to. <laughs> but you can speak to. Good evening, President De Serpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. So I bring forth to you um, again our core um, contract to support our SIPs implementation for this next year. So you have seen the success, right? And so this is just the continued support for the job embedded coaching um, for our um, teachers as we have continued to add additional schools, right? So we have our, all of our elementary schools covered now. And so this is just that, uh, that um, action item. And I'm requesting your approval for another year to support our teachers in early literacy. Are there any speakers to this item? speakers are there any comments or discussion from the board Jen Holmes just a quick comment you know I've been over the years and you know especially recently I've been having a number of conversations with teachers and how SIPS has been implemented and um, just how it's really made a difference in student rating progress so I happily support this and we'll make the motion I'll second okay and um, Wholeheartedly, I support this, given the achievement of our kids in this district over the last five years. I think this is working. This is a success. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, item 9.13, approve agreement for SIPs and rewards training for middle school sites. That's Heather Gorman, okay. our self I can read on my face, even with the mask on. Good job. I know. <laughs> Sorry about that. So good evening again, President DeSerpa, Board um, of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. I bring before you the core consultant agreement for middle schools reading support. We have a critical need um, for this ongoing training and support for our new teachers and refreshers training for our returning teachers. It's not too late to teach adolescent students to learn to read. Um, this process takes time, especially when it includes learning new instructional practices and concepts 
The teachers and instructional assistants benefit from the ongoing coaching support from Gail Adams and Artosa, Eric Harriman. Teachers that receive sustained, relevant instructional support have the ability to improve student achievement. Um, with this in mind, I recommend that you approve the core consultant agreement for the 22-23 school year for um, SIPs and rewards. We have no speakers to this item. Thank you. Are there any um, discussion or questions from the board on this item? I have a clarifying okay, question. Okay, Jen. Um, we started SIPs in middle school last year, correct? So. Well, I guess you would say, say two years, years ago. ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because we had the pandemic, so that really didn't help. So, yeah. okay. That's all I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Okay. Looking for a motion? I'll move to approve. We'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Item next up, 9.14, approve Bradley Elementary parking lot improvement, project number 8120. This one feels like a long time coming, actually, <laughs> right? We've been talking about this for about mm, 10 um, years, maybe longer, <laughs> 12. I'm not sure I'm here to speak that long, All right. but um, I'll say uh, <laughs> good evening, President de Serpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. I'm Rich Ariano, the Director of Purchasing, and um, for your approval tonight, I have the award of uh, the bid for the Bradley Elementary Parking Lot Improvement Project. This is a Measure L bond funded project, and you can see um, that we received four sealed bids. The apparent low bidder for the project is Monterey Peninsula Engineering with a bid of $707,000. And the general scope of this project is gonna be to remove and repave the front of the school it's going to add, um, it's going to almost double the amount of parking spaces they have, and they're going to increase from um, one ADA spark parking spot to three. Um, the bid was uh, with the additive alternate, alternate was within budget to add a concrete sidewalk to the new addition of the parking lot. And so I'm asking for your approval to award the bid to Monterey Peninsula Engineering. Are there any speakers to this item? No. No. Do, are there any comments? Okay. Just a, uh, a quick yeah, one. Go ahead. Um, just so you know, I know I've I've had you know comments from constituents. It's like, well, hey, how come this school is going to go? You know, parking lot. What about you know my school? And, but this is a Measure L. Correct. Can you talk a little bit, like, just for for the benefit of the public who may not understand how you know Measure L works? Can you just say how sites determine what projects? Um, I'm not sure I can speak to how they're determined. I know that they would have. If you can do it now, okay. I can speak to that. <laughs> I'll step in and then if Dr. Rodriguez wants to finish off. Um, so Measure L, back when we passed it originally, there were really two big phases. One was what we sent out to the voters who voted on Measure L, who voted on the kind of scope of the projects we'd be doing for each site, what their major needs were. This was done through a facility master plan and an evaluation of each site. And then the sites themselves also met with their school site councils and talked about some of their major projects they wanted to do at their site. So each site did have some oversight of what they wanted to do with their Measure L funds. So while many sites may needed a, have needed a parking lot, they did not decide that that was the priority for, for their site or in reviewing their facilities, there were other major uh, projects that would have been done in advance of doing that and then based on how much measure all funding they had, seeing where it fell on their project list. So yes, this is not funding directly from the district given to Bradley. This is from their measure L that they originally received back from the bond passed in 2012. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Appreciate Carson. that. Okay. Any other comments? So do we have a motion? I move to approve. I'll second. Okay. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Next is item 9.13, no sorry, 15, approved Calabasas Elementary Admin, I don't know what the admin part means, HVAC Modernization and Re-Roofing Project. Administrative. Administrative building, okay, thanks. Good evening again. So um, for this project, um, we are asking for the approval of the of the bid for uh, modernizing, re-roofing, and um, 
so the modernization would be for the HVAC units on the buildings. And this is an ESSER funded project. So the board had previously approved um, approximately $30 million to improve uh, health and safety infrastructure for our schools. And this is the project that was selected for Calabasas Elementary. So the uh, construction department received a total of one bid uh, from uh, Premier Builders of Gilroy for $2,075,717. And we are asking for the approval of the award of their bid. We have no speakers to this item. Okay, any comments or discussion with the board? Just have one clarifying question, if I may. Sure. The re-roofing, is it just re-roofing <coughs> the admin building? No, so it is it is re-roofing, I'm sorry, um, wings A, B, C, and E. So from, okay. from this graphic, it's the um, the dark gray shaded okay. buildings. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And the HVAC units for each building. Thank, Thank you. Clarifying questions. Yeah. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. Okay. So are they taking the, the foam roofs to go away now? That is my understanding that the roofs are being removed, the, the existing. Constant money pit just to keep repairing those, so that's good. This is getting taken mm -hmm. care of. And I'm surprised you only got one bid on this guy. So, for this one, um, yeah, there, there was a lot of interest in the project. There were 13 contractors that walked the job and, and saw it and, and got you know, had the opportunity, little? but that was the only one that was submitted. Okay, okay we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Item 9.16, approve the Duncan Holbert classroom installation project. All right, me again, good evening. Um, so this project is for uh, purchase and installation of three new portable buildings for Duncan Holbert. Um, it is funded by developer fees. Uh, the planning department received a total of three sealed bids with the low bidder being Monterey Peninsula Engineering with a total bid of $453,000. And these portables are to be installed near the um, kind of the rear parking lot of Rolling Hills Middle School. I think mm. there may be an existing maybe portable container there now, but there'll be three brand new classrooms that are gonna be um, installed there. Seeking your approval for the bid from MPE. Okay, are there any speakers? None. Okay, any discussion or questions from the board? No questions, yes, I'm glad this is moving forward. Finally, <laughs> <laughs> this has been three years in the making, I mm -hmm. think, or a little yeah. bit more. Um, so I'll gladly make a motion to approve this item. I'll, I'll second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries unanimously, thank you. Um, Item 9.17, approve Hall District Elementary School parking lot improvement project number 8530. All right, good evening again. Um, so yep, asking for your approval for the bid to uh, re remove and repave the parking lot um, and expand the parking lot at Hall District Elementary School. This is a Measure L bond funded project. Um, a total of seven bids were received for the project, the low bid was from Kent Construction of Gilroy for $1,158,000. And the scope of this project is to um, pave really the upper part of the campus at Hall District, improve the traffic flow, um, improve the safety for, for students that um, unload and load onto buses, and to add more accessibility from that upper part of the campus down to the lower part. So right now I think there's only one existing stairwell with this project. They're gonna add a concrete walkway that kind of switches back and is um, much more accessible. Um, and there's sort of the graphic of, of what the, uh, the project's gonna, the scope and area that it's gonna cover. And that is the existing campus. So with, um, yeah, asking for your approval for the bid from Kent Construction to complete this project. Speakers to this item? None. Any um, questions or discussion from the board? Question. Uh huh, Jen? Uh, is this with ESSER funds? Is this one? This one's Measure L. This one's Measure L. Yes. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to clarify. I guess I'll make a motion to approve, but I, <laughs> but I, um, 
I'm glad to see this is finally happening too. Um, I think it's, uh, we've heard it, uh, at least from the community, they've had like meetings in their ca cafeteria to address just the concerns around traffic and accessibility and so forth. So I think this is gonna be really helpful for that school site. Okay, we have a first, right? All mm -hmm. second. A second, okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Um, item 9.18, approve Lakeville, Lakeview Middle School C and D wing re-roofing project 2022-2017. Okay, so um, this is going to be the ESSER project Let's selected for Lakeview Middle School. It's gonna be to re-roof wings C and D and um, this one received a total of five sealed bids with the low bidder being INA Contractor Inc. of Redwood City with a total bid of $479,000. And um, again, asking for your approval to move forward with awarding the bid and entering into a contract for the project. Okay, any speakers? None. None, okay. Any discussion or comments from the board? Looking for a motion? Move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Hi, uh, motion carries unanimously, thank you. Item 9.20, approve uh, 19, six. It's 9.19, that Rolling Hills. Oh, I missed Rolling Hills, I'm so sorry. Sorry, item 9.19, approve Sigamura Finney Architect Agreement, uh, Rolling Hills Middle School Gym Bleachers Modernization Project number 2023-017. Okay, thank you. Good evening again. This uh, it, item is for an agreement with Sugimura Finney Architects to uh, design the installation of a brand new bleacher system for Rolling Hills Middle School. Uh, the project has a construction estimate right now of $100,000. The fee for um, Sugimura Finney's uh, design services is $8,000 and that is what we are asking for your approval for tonight. Um, this project is re to replace bleachers that we're estimating are probably 40-ish years old or older and um, are mm -hmm. not very, not utilized very much by the site. So this is another one that kind of fits into that long time coming category. Um, I'm excited to work on this one with the Rolling Hills staff. Uh, Dr. Alcaraz has advocated for this project for, for quite a while and we've, we found a way to um, finally get it off the ground and get it moving. And so asking for your approval tonight to get it started with the architects and, and get the project designed. This is another project I'm very excited about. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we had the same bleachers when I attended that school. Um, well, you're not that old. <laughs> you weren't there that long ago. <laughs> so, okay, are there any speakers to this one? There's no speakers Okay, did you want to continue with some comments? I want to make a motion to approve this item. Okay. Second. Um, I, you have a we have a second down yeah. on the scent okay and Jen do you have a quick comment yeah just a I, I love it when y'all include pictures so like mm -hmm. we can actually see what yeah. where things are and then especially like when it's done yeah love to see the picture of the after so some of them are easier than others this one was, was very easy to, to put it together and show exactly what we're going to be working on um, the roofing ones I, I yeah. I'll go up there and I'll get them if you want. But, um, <laughs> I'd like to ask something about um, the reclamation of this beautiful wood. Um, oh. So that you can't get wood sometimes like this any longer. And oh, we're, um, Jackal Enterprises sometimes will take all that back. But I don't know what um, you guys end up doing. But this should not go into the landfill. Right. So I believe it's just the seats that are wood. wood. And we're just talking about the bleachers, right? Yeah. 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 Um, the faces of them, what you can see in the picture, are, are all metal. and a lot Oh, they of are. Okay. Started to deteriorate. Okay. Um, well, if there's wood that can be reclaimed, it should be. Um, that's just all I'm going to say. Okay. Um, we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Now we're on item 9.20, approve 196 Architects Agreement for Child Development at Calabasas Elementary School, a shade structure project number 2023-016. All right, um, so for my final item of the evening, this one is for the uh, design services with 196 Architects for a new shade structure 
um, on the Calabasas campus for the child development department. They have one-time funding that they will be using to install this shade structure. And the construction estimate right now is $80,000 for the entire you know, construction portion of the project. The architect fee for this, uh, for the design services is $9,100, which we are asking for your approval tonight. No speakers. Okay, any questions? Quick I'll make a motion. Wait, we have a quick question quick, from quick, Jen Holmes. Just a quick comment. Just I've gotten a lot of, you know, I've been able to go to a number of sites and seeing how, you know, our shade structures have been implemented. And I know I was like, well, you know, okay, how well are they working? And they're working great. You know, it's like we were out there for the ROV competition at, you know, Watsonville High School, and it was great. And I've seen the one at Aptos High, Aptos Junior, Rio. Um, and I've gotten a lot of good feedback mm -hmm. from, you know, people at the sites about them. So just wanted to say they're, 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 going, they're going well. Thanks, Jen. Is there uh, any other comments or questions? Okay, looking for a motion. Did I have a motion? You did. I'll um, second. I Jen, made the motion. You made the motion? Right. Second. Right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think you're done. Thanks for standing up there for such a long time. Item 9.21, Martha's Kitchen and PBUSD Family Engagement and Wellness Center. Good evening, uh, President Kim DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. My name is Chrissy McLean, and I am the coordinator of academic and social emotional counseling programs. And I'm very excited to present this item to you this evening, and I'm very excited for this to be the first time that I get to present an item to the group here. Um, the PBUSD Family Engagement and Wellness Centers had the opportunity to partner with Martha's Kitchen. Martha's Kitchen offers healthy frozen meals and other hot food options to those in need. We have currently worked with them to establish a trial with frozen meals being available at the Wellness Center. Um, these meals are currently identified for supporting our Healthy Start families. The service will occur on Friday evenings, and our beginning capacity is 25 families five, uh, at an average of five meals per family. Um, as we're picking up 125 meals each week from the Martha Kitchen, the Martha's Kitchen um, service. Oh, my glasses will help me read this. <laughs> um, uh, these meals are prepped, well balanced nutrition, and they only require heating. Uh, this is ideal for families that, um, based on current living options, may not have access to a full kitchen, uh, may be living in a motel. Uh, Martha's Kitchen will continue to increase the number of meals supplied as our space and our freezer capacity increase. As we monitor data to identify busiest times and times of higher need, Martha's Kitchen can also um, offer hot food in to-go containers or the ability for families to enjoy um, out meal, outdoor meals, like if we have the hot food there, um, families could come get the hot food and sit down and enjoy community there at the Wellness Center. Um, this service will complement and be in parallel to Second Harvest Food Co-op, as well as be able to supplement um, the offerings to all of our PBUSD families, helping our students thrive. This would allow our families, um, when they come, when they're able to pick up food from uh, Second Harvest Food Bank to cook throughout the week, they can also grab a frozen dinner to either eat at the, the center and or go home and heat it up. Uh, there is no financial cost to our agreement with Martha's Kitchen. We look forward to another partner in assisting with families and as I said prior, helping our students thrive. I um, hope that this MOU is approved this evening. Do we have any speakers? No speakers. Any questions or comments from the board? Jen Schalker? Oh, I was just going to say, are there microwaves at the center that we have for families to use? We Go ahead. Right now we have just one micro microwave in the first um, module in Portable A. And there is the possibility that we could get a couple more as the need for the, that hot food we would definitely start to, to look at maybe stepping into the other services that Martha's Kitchen offers. But families are, especially since we're at this capacity of low capacity, families are 
offered to heat it up in that microwave. It's just we have limited space for that. Right. Okay. I'm just clarifying. Thank you. No, I wholeheartedly support um, the Martha's Kitchen MOU. I think it's the more resources we can bring to our community, the better, especially since a lot of families struggle. Um, so I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second that motion. I'm also in full support. And I think um, Daniel Dodge Jr. has a comment. I, I'd just like to say thank you, Chrissy, for everything you're doing out there. You know, I've seen you a couple times in action. Um, the way you work with other no, nonprofit organizations, whether it's tutoring and food and the second harvest, um, it, it's always busy, but a good kind of busy there. And I'd just like to say thank you. You have a comment? I have a question about um, how this is being provided at no cost. Are they billing on behalf of our students, or how are they providing this food to us with no cost? Because um, I kept looking over this proposal, and I was like, where is the cost? Uh, um, it would probably um, been a good idea to put a link to their website. So Martha's Kitchen, their, um, their slogan is feeding the hungry with dignity. Um, and as I met with that group, learning about, they're based out of San Jose, and they, they partner, they, they are similar to um, Second Harvest Food Bank in the sense that they get, the, the, they get grants, they get donations, they're a very hard working group at getting food from all over as best as they can, and they have volunteers that cook food, that wrap the food, and they, their, one of their main things is they ask, they want to partner with other communities because they know that, that, like, we know our community best and we know the best avenue to get to the family. So their, their organization is purely just there to help other organizations get the food to the families. And they handle all of the, so the funding through their own resources. So it's just weird to me that they're in Santa Clara County and that they're helping us over here in Santa Cruz. Are they asking for any data on any of these kids, their demographics, their Medi-Cal numbers, how many? No. Nothing. And I, I okay. will say that um, they ha this is not the first service they have here in Watsonville. Every Friday also at between 5 and 6 p.m., you might notice that there's a um, sort of a backup in the alley that goes sort of from off Maple behind Salud towards uh, to towards the market, mm -hmm. uh, the, and um, that's because at the back of the Presby is it Presbyterian Church. I apologize if I am, am misnaming which kind of church it is, but that church that's on uh, East Beach. Okay, in the in the back parking lot, they have. Um, they have food that they give out between five and six for any family in the community, including they have, they also partner with Second Harvest Food Bank of, of Silicon Valley. So they have food that they can pick up and they have the, the hot food there too for families to come and get their to-go food. So they, they have been serving through that, uh, that church. I, mean, I do not know for how long, but it's been at least a year, if not longer. Um, so we're just adding another place where people can get um, services from Martha's. Which is nice. Um, you know what I would like us to do? I mean, I'm not opposed to voting on this tonight, but I would like us to talk with Teen Kitchen Project, mm. which is our local vendor for people that are needy, and they get a, most of their donations from Lakeside Organics, mm -hmm. and they could probably also benefit from partnering with us. So I'd just like to see if that's a possibility. Yes, I, I wrote it down. Okay. I'm sorry, did we have a first and second? I'm too yes. tired mm -hmm. to know. Yeah, okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. And nice to meet you. Oh. It's great to see you here. Um, item 9.22, letter of agreement between the C Central California Alliance for Health and the Pajaro Valley Unified School District for Student Behavioral Health Incentive Program. Yeah, so thanks so much. So something that we've been focusing on is really providing access to preventative and early intervention in behavioral health supports. 
So through this group, we had the Department of Healthcare Services and um, the Student Behavioral Health Incentive Program reach out to us um, through the Alliance to find out if we wanted to engage with them through this collaborative effort. So um, we're partnering for us, um, we are partnering with PVPSA and ourselves and um, this group um, to really help um, ensure that we're increasing our systems um, to provide access to that preventative early intervention. Um, and so there is a small amount of Funding that we will be receiving, but the most important piece is what we always talk about, which is looking at cohesive and consistent collaboration among partners, and that's what this will provide us. So it's going to provide us a small monetary amount of about $88,000. So it's not really about the money itself as much as our willingness and dedication to harness the skill set of the Alliance and our partners to provide these services to students and their families. And so I ask you to approve um, this letter of agreement um, so we can move forward. Are there any speakers? Uh, we don't have speakers to this item. Okay, anyone have any questions? I'll make a motion to approve. Okay, I'd like to second. I do have just a quick question That's about, um, it does seem like in this particular scenario, we do have to share information. A lot of it, as a matter of fact. And I understand it's being reported up to the Department of Healthcare Services, so I think it, this what this is, is Central California Alliance for Health, which is a managed Medi-Cal healthcare plan for our area, is required to give demographic information about the services that are provided, road mapping them and providing that up to DHCS. I would say that that is true. We are going to be heavily data driven so that we can ensure that we have the systems in place in order to support families. So we will be looking at those systems and um, we'll make sure and and comply with all HIPAA and FERPA requirements, but um, we're, there will be a sharing of data, but technically there's a sharing of data with people who receive that data anyways through our Medi-Cal billing. Um, and so um, I don't really think that there's any sharing of information with parties who wouldn't already have that yeah, data. Yeah, healthcare plans are required to provide behavioral health benefits to people that um, are in the plan. And it's been um, a, a big issue because there aren't enough therapists to take children and youth in our community. And so I think what they're trying to do is roadmap what the services in resources. the community are. Yeah, so yeah, that. Not being resources. Yeah. Sure. So, anyway, so I, I'm hoping it'll bring more resources to our area to serve kids and youth because we yes. really need that. So, thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. So, we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, item 9.23, a board study session for August 31st, 2022. Yeah, so for years we had a special board study session to look at data. We postponed that for two years because with the pandemic we didn't actually have the majority of the um, statewide assessments. Um, we now are engaging, you heard some students talking about it today, where actually the students are currently, for the most part, engaging in SPAC testing. They've been engaging in LPAC testing. So AP testing is back in full force. Um, and so we want to be able to share that data with you all. And so we're requesting a special board study session be placed on August 31st so we can utilize that time to discuss data. Thank you. Are there any um, questions or any speakers, first of all? No speakers. Any questions for the board? Are we going to do map data also? Yes, we will do um, localized data such as map and also dibbles in EDEL. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Uh, Trustee Acosta? Um, yes, I just had um, a question about this meeting. So, um, since it is um, a special meeting and it's not on um, the board's calendar for meetings for the calendar year, which was approved before the calendar year began in January. Is it possible to hold this one to accommodate all board members' schedules virtually? Um, I mean, we can definitely have that discussion with the agenda setting committee. 
I, I will say it's generally challenging to do board study sessions um, virtually with the way that I'd like to present it, but um, if agenda setting would like to do it that way, um, staff will accommodate for sure. I, um, or we can make that decision here. It's up to the board. Generally, we would talk about an agenda setting, but we can either do it here um, President just or would rather do it here. Well, I, you know, I'll be honest with you. In a board study session, I really like it to be face-to-face. -face. Um, if, if you cannot make it to a face-to-face -face, um, meeting, you know, potentially we could pipe you in somehow if you're on vacation, but um, I, want to, I would like to be in person to see the data and to have the discussion. Um, so, are, any other comments on that matter? Okay. If accommodations could be given, at least for board members to be virtual, because this wasn't on the calendar that was approved for the calendar year, I sure, appreciate that, that. That definitely can happen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just, um, well, we just need to connect before, so I can properly. Yeah. If you it. could remind that connection to board members, so because I believe we have to reach out to you and let you know yeah, so many days before you print yeah. the agenda. I mean, publicize I'll, the agenda, I'll, not I'll, print. I'll do a reminder. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate that. Okay. So um, I need a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. Okay. All those in favor of the board study session on August 31st, 2022? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstention? I think the motion carried 7-0. And now on to our consent agenda. Um, and with great gratitude again for all the donations um, that came in on behalf of the Merrill Lagasse Culinary Kitchen. We thank all the donors. We can, could not do it without you. Um, looking for a motion to approve the consent agenda. I move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Um, and next up, we'll report on um, our action items from closed session. Okay, so under item 2.1, I move to approve the district administration for a full expulsion for the remainder of the school year and the 22-23 um, school year for student number 2122017. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries, I think, unanimously there. Did we already vote on these in there? No. No, okay. Under the same item, I move to approve for um, uh, the district administration recommendation for a full expulsion for the remainder of the school year and the 22-23 school year for student number 21-22016. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Now under item 2.2, I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by the district administration on April 27, 2022 with 57 and 17 additional action items. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Under item 2.3, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by the district administration on April 27, 2022 with 36 and 11 additional action items. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And then <laughs> under item 2.7, liability claim, the board voted with a seven seven zero zero vote uh, to reject the claim identified in closed session item number 2.7 and I do have two announcements three announcements first announcement the Paro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Ivan Alcaraz as the new director of student services Mr. Alcaraz has been serving students of the Paro Valley since 2013 as an intervention counselor before becoming an assistant principal at Watsonville High School. He has served as a principal of Rolling Hills Middle School since 2019. Mr. Alcaraz is a local resident of Watsonville 
and a former student of PBUSD. He obtained his Bachelor of, Art, of Arts in Business Management Economics at UC, UC Santa Cruz, his Master's in Education in Counseling and Student Personnel, Master's of Education in Administration and Supervision, and his Doctorate in Educational Leadership. We are proud to welcome this highly accomplished educator to his new administrative role. Announcement number two. The Pearl Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Mary Ann Vasquez Hilton as the new assistant principal of Pearl Middle School. Ms. Vasquez Hilton has been serving students since 2008 in various roles, such as, such as a bilingual teacher, technology liaison, ELA ELD, curriculum coordinator, and most recently as a director of curriculum and instruction for the Live Oak School District. Ms. Vasquez Hilton holds a master's in education from the Grand Canyon University, a master's in art from UC Santa Cruz, and a bachelor's of arts in Latin American and Iberian studies from UCSB. She also holds a multiple subject credential and a BCLAD from UC Santa Cruz. We're proud to welcome this highly accomplished educator to his new, to her new administrative role. And Announcement number three. On behalf of our superintendent and district administration, we're pleased to announce Mr. Erlindo Fernandez's promotion to director, maintenance, operations, and facilities. Mr. Fernandez has worked with PVUSD for 33 years and brings a wealth of experience from a variety of positions he has held with the district. He started as a custodian in 1989, moved into the grounds department in a leadership role work as a maintenance specialist and in his most recent years with the district has worked as an energy management technician, planning specialist, and over the last year as supervisor maintenance. His district-wide knowledge and understanding of the maintenance and operation systems of the district are invaluable. He is skilled at listening, processing information, and implementing an action plan. He handles challenging situations with diplomacy and professionalism. We are proud to promote Mr. Fernandez to our Director of Maintenance Operations and Facilities. He looks forward to serving the district and continuing the good work of improving district facilities in his new role. Congratulations. And that's all we have. Thank you. So we congratulate all, um, all of those promotions. Um, and look forward to working with them and having them here at our board meetings until late, late into the night. Um, our upcoming meeting is on May 11th, and we hope to see you all there. And tonight's meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.